And we are now live. So anybody tuning in from Facebook Live, please understand that we are going to get started in about 10 minutes. Um, so if you could just sit tight for a little while, we will, Council Member Richards, as well as Council Member Adams and Council Member Miller will be joining us to have a conversation on race, reform, and resolutions. So we're starting at 6 p.m. You want to grab some popcorn, some cheese doodles, or maybe an apple, something a little healthier. Feel free to do that right now, and we will get started in five minutes or so. Ma'am, well, CM um, Brad Lander will also be joining at 6.30. Oh, so we're also going to have Council Member Lander on here. And, um, that'll be, will be during the conversation. All right, so sit tight for a few more minutes as we wait on our panelists and um, we'll be getting started at 6 p.m.
So it's Manny Silva again, Chief of Staff of Council Member Donovan Richards. We're gonna get started in a few minutes. We're still waiting on a few panelists. So just sit tight. Once again, you can grab some trail mix, some cereal, maybe popcorn, um, and get prepared for a great conversation, an honest conversation, and one that needs to be happening right now. Uh, and uh, soon, shortly, the council members and rest, the rest of the panelists will be here and they'll get started. Hello, everyone. Hi. How y'all doing? Good. Good. Hi, Tiff. Hi, Sam. Who are we waiting for now? I think we were waiting for you. Wait for Andre. Let's see. Oh, wait. Yeah, he's on the list of panelists. Who? Who else? Andre. Oh, Manny, check your phone. Uh, um, he won't be joining us. Let's see. And the council members, council member Adams and council member Miller. All right, well, when they hop on, they could do. So we're going to get started because I got other things I got to deal with. So we're going to get started in about a minute. And then when they join on, we'll, you know, at least we'll begin through the remarks and they'll they could join on. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 How are you? Good. Tired, but good. Hanging in there. All right, Minnie, so um, we're gonna get started. And then when they come on, they could join. So let me know when we're ready. Yeah, everything is good to go. All right, so we're ready, we're live. You're live. All righty, well, good after good evening, everybody. And first off, I wanna thank uh, uh, my legislative director, Tiffany Easton, for putting this together, this panel together. Um, you know, it's been some trying times, but it's also been a time where we turn crises into opportunity. And there's been a lot of movement um, in the state and on the city level and on the federal level on police reform, finally. And tonight, we have some distinguished panelists who do this work day in and day out. Uh, but I just want to give a quick city um, uh, analysis of where we're at. It's, it's really been um, just a unique moment and, and largely because of the unrest that we've seen around the country. And I, I just have to put that out there that none of this would be possible without the work of um, the protesters out there who are out every single day. I think there's been a protest every single day for the last three weeks. I've been to many of them um, in Queens, but I want you to know that, you know, George Floyd's death was not in vain. I mean, you look at some of the reforms that were put in place, 50A, something we were calling for going back, I meant years, and how that just at the snap of a, a dime happened. Um, you look at the governor signing the Right to Record Act um, today as well, and some other pieces of legislation. You look at what we're gonna do on this Thursday in my committee, as, as I chair the Public Safety Committee, how we're going to pass about seven or eight pieces of legislation, uh, a large variation of legislation that's really going to 
help to reform the police department, although we're not out of the woods. And then you look at this evening, um, and right before I got on this call, I got a call from um, WNYC. Um, for many of you who've had to endure plainclothes cops for many years, uh, these plainclothes units who come into our neighborhoods and uh, they pat us down and they leave out. And one of the things that was always interesting about plain clothes is that they're not necessarily assigned to the local precinct. So it's hard to track them down when you have a complaint. So I always considered plain clothes units as rogue units that run amok in our communities and then could hide their hand um, because they're not necessarily based out of the um, local precincts in our communities. So we would have to track them down. What's the time that they were in the neighborhood? You know, a quick story. I remember um, my first stop and first um, actually uh, experiences with us uh, with plainclothes units who accused me and my cousin at the age of about 13 of a robbery, although we had just walked from my grandmother's house to a friend's house. And, um, and they pulled guns on us. That was my first experience with plainclothes Fast forward, I remember um, my parents moved to Hollis. Um, I think I came home from school and my father and I, it's a hot summer night, is sitting on a step in plain clothes roll up on us. What are you doing sitting on these steps? And we're like, we live here. You know, this is, this is our house. This is why we're here. Um, so those experiences around plain clothes are, are something that we know is problematic for our communities. And I think the reforms that the police commissioner um, announced, I'm not sure if you're aware, he's moving 600 plainclothes officers into um, the detective bureau and also into neighborhood policing. So that's a real, when we talk about a seismic shift in the way policy moves, um, that is seismic. And, you know, I've been, you know, criticizing the mayor a lot and, you know, it's not nothing personal when we talk about criticizing the mayor, but we have a larger responsibility to our constituents, to our communities to ensure that the police is, are doing right and that we're using this moment, not just to paint Black Lives Matter on the streets. And that's a good gesture, but it says nothing when it comes to policies and the budget. And so we're gonna hop into a little bit of everything tonight. You know, there's been a lot of talk around defunding the NYPD. I'm interested in hearing um, some opinions on that and what does it mean for you? You know, there are some people on the spectrum who say it means abolishing the police. There are other people on different spectrums who say it means cutting the budget. So I wanna hop into that a little bit. And then I wanna talk a little bit more. I wanna hear from you all about, you know, what, where do we need to go after the protest? And, and what are you seeing on the streets in particular during the protest? Um, I held a 10 hour hearing last week and it was not pleasant. We had over, I think close to 200, a little bit over a hundred people who testified at our hearing, including uh, the uh, deputy uh, commissioner of Benjamin Tucker. Um, commissioner Shea did not show up to that hearing. Um, but the NYPD got to hear it from council members and subsequently left the hearing, but we had to sit through about six hours of public testimony on what people endured during those protests. And, you know, I want to put out there, you know, they, they, you know, it seemed the, the message seems to keep getting convoluted when it comes to the looting and what people are doing out there. And I, I just want to make it plain that those who are out there marching for justice are not out stealing Nikes. If you're stealing Nikes, you are not part of this movement. That is not what people who are marching for justice are looking for. Um, I, I got to speak to Valerie Bell this morning, and you know, it was sort of like this sigh of relief, like finally the chokehold bill passed at the state level. You know, we're going to clean up and um, certainly um, reduce some loopholes in that bill on this Thursday as we voted out of my committee and out of the city council. But, you know, we have to use this moment wisely while the momentum is on our side to really reform the police department. And it doesn't mean, you know, some people have this interpretation that when you're um, reforming the police or you're anti-police brutality, that you're anti-police, right? Um, and it's very important to distinguish the two. You know, there I hear from people who don't live in our communities often who, you know, who think we don't want a relationship with the police department. It's not necessarily true. We just don't think the police department should be involved in every facet of our life. We don't think they should be called for every single um, emergency that we endure. We think that services and other things um, should certainly help to fill those gaps and we should have some creative ways of um, addressing a lot of the systematic issues that um, uh, hurt our community. So we're gonna hop into it and I wanna introduce the panelists. Um, 
want to recognize we're joined by Tiffany Eason, who is my director of communications and legislation and founder of It's For You. And she's a lifelong resident of South Queens, where she's invested in sustainable social development and community service. Uh, da, da, da. And she earned her BS in public relations and MS in international communication from St. John's University. It's for you mission is to serve the community through leadership development, cultural and creative resources, events, programs, and information. Um, it's Martha on Martha Aon is a lifelong community activist that brings change to communities all over New York City. And she's been shaking things up in particular in Queens, um, but has done a lot of work around advocacy around the police and so many other areas to bring justice to our communities. We're also joined by Curleen Joseph Esquire who grew up in Jamaica, Queens. After completing her BA in political science, Ms. Joseph went on to obtain her Juris Doctorate at Boston uh, College Law School, having worked at Legal Aid Society in the past. Her criminal defense expertise has impacted the Queens community, serving as an attorney in several capacities. She uh, currently, Curlin is the director of special projects for the Queens Defenders, and I wanna thank them for the work that they're doing from Jamaica all the way to Far Rockaway. Her areas of specialty include, but is not limited to criminal law, juvenile delinquency and raise the age youth cases, family law, custody, visitation, abuse and neglect, paternity and family offense petitions. Carlene returned home to Queens to serve her community. So as you can see, she's a very busy young lady. Very <laughs> proud of her and the work she does. Alain, Alain Barrett is the criminal justice committee chair for the Jamaica NAACP branch in New York. He earned a degree in criminal justice from CUNY John Jay College. Mr. Biarrett was ca uh, catapulted into advance and equity when he was stopped and frisked at gunpoint by three plainclothes police officers as a college freshman. So we talk about those plainclothes units. Alain is, a pa is passionate about bringing people together and building coalitions for the betterment of everyone. And then last but not least, we are joined by Andrea Colon, who is a board member of Queens Community Board 14 where she plays an active role in shaping our communities through communication and neighborhood planning. She is also the lead organizer at Rockaway Youth Task Force, where she serves to increase social and economic security and eliminate racial justice for residents of the Rockaway Peninsula and beyond, and is also part of a strong coalition of folks who have, oh, oh I think I just disappeared for a second. <laughs> sorry, I hit the wrong thing. Um, a strong coalition of folks who, um, sorry, I get these texts through and all this stuff. Um, a uh, strong coalition of advocacy groups who've really been pushing us to reimagine what does policing look like in the 21st century um, for our community. So before we hop into it, um, we're joined by my colleague who has been very busy. Um, I saw the mayor was out in her district this week. Um, she was also on the news this week, um, uh, pushing for more resources for the Cure Violence Program Crisis Management System. And that is my sister, um, uh, Adrian Adams, so I want to give her an opportunity to give some remarks before we hop into it. Thank you so much, Councilmember Richards, uh, my brother. Um, thank you for having this really important um, talk this evening. I am so impressed uh, by our activist panelists tonight and seeing you all here and hearing you all. And um, I really just want to, first of all, say, this isn't my house. This is a background of, okay, just want to. <laughs> so uh, we've been going through a lot lately. Um, as, as of late, you know, uh, and, and I keep saying, we've heard the expression so often, you know, stay woke, stay woke, but we were never asleep uh, in our communities. We had to be woke. Um, on a lot of different levels. We had to be woke because as black mothers, we've had to teach our black sons to fear the police, uh, for lack of a better way to say it. That's just plain and simple. We've had to teach our black sons to act differently because of the color of their skin. And it is, it, it is really something to think about that, having to live that way. But to hear the different stories of our Black sons and daughters who are harassed on a daily basis, who are accosted for walking out of their front door for no apparent reason other than some kind of an ego trip um, by NYPD is absolutely appalling. Uh, and the stories don't stop. My own son was stopped um, at 15 years old. He used to ride his bike all the time and he was stopped riding his bike. 
Um, so, uh, and got a summons for that. Uh, I, I mean, just things go on. That's, that's the very least, you know, of the stories that, uh, that we've heard over the years. But I'm just really excited to, uh, to have this discussion tonight, to hear from our panelists, because we keep being, we're told all the time that what we know is fact is actually fiction. We keep being told that, you know, no one's really bothering you. Police are taking care of you. They're protecting you. Um, people aren't really dying in the proportion that, that you people say that they're dying. But we all know this is not true. I mean, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Ahmaud Aubrey, Sean Bell, George Floyd, and now um, Rashad Brooks, uh, our eyes are not lying and our feelings are not for centuries, uh, uh, over 400 years in this country. And this continues to be what is perpetrated due to systemic racism. So I'm gonna stop. And uh, I, I am just, again, really, really thankful for these activist panelists uh, to give us your insight. Um, I know many of you well, so I wanna thank you again for everything that you've done over the years and continue to do for us, for our people, uh, and the education and the upliftment of our children. Thank you, Council Member Richards, also known as my baby brother. Thank you, big sis. And we're gonna hop right into it. So how did we get here, y'all? I wanna start with Martha. What, what got us here? Yeah, you're a troublemaker, so I, I want to start with you. Um, what got us here? Why are we here right now? Um, thank y'all for having me. Um, you know, some would say it's because policing was made to protect the rich from looting, from looters, and also to uh, capture runaway slaves and bring them back to their masters. Um, we have a historical legacy of having police police bodies that are black and um, attack our children and treat us as property. Um, I think that we should think about the fact of how safety has been interpreted over the years and it's definitely a generational divide. Um, I was reading before I got on this um, about the 1967 uh, Kerner Commission, which was uh, brought out by President Lyndon B. Johnson to address the riots in 1967 in over 20 cities. Um, and it's been interesting to hear how similar it is. There's the same riots that are happening um, and the same conclusions that were made now as they were in 1967 about community policing and de-escalating the tension between um, the crowd and the police. Um, I think that we need to take a step back and look at where we are and what we deem as safety versus maybe refocusing the NYPD towards actually preserving civil peace and not talk about it in a sense of safety. Um, but in a Queens perspective, uh, Queens has always been segregated. You know, uh, there's the joke that, uh, you know, Archie Bunker is alive and well in Queens. Um, our, our borough is very much segregated. It does not matter if you're a homeowner. It does not matter if you live in NYCHA. If you're a black and brown, you will be treated the same way. And as we spoke about at the teach-in in Forest Hills, the experience of being black all over Queens doesn't matter whether you are a co-op owner or if you live in NYCHA or a rental, we are all treated the same. And we travel throughout Queens black. I'm living in Rego Park, growing up around white right people does not make me any less, sustain, you know, less likely to be stopped by police. So it's something that we have to just think about is that what it means to be black, what it means to be in Queens in a place that's still segregated, segregated by income, and also what we deem as policing in Queens. So thanks. Thank you. We're gonna to go to Al Lane. I want you to dip into that. How did we get here? Uh, first off, thank you for having me on. Um, thank you to all these wonderful panelists and individuals who are doing amazing things. Um, in terms of you know how we got here, I think it, it's just such a large question, and I'm just trying to pinpoint where I want to start. You know, I think when it comes to law enforcement, law enforcement has um, a lot of resources, and when I say resources, they have a public relations department that I feel like have socially conditioned, 
you know, people to view police as the heroes at all costs. And, you know, something that I've been wondering about is, you know, when a police officer is unfortunately murdered in the street or, you know, something happens to a police officer, it's like lockstep, like all of the news organizations lockstep together. This man was a hero. He made his complete sacrifice, um, you know, to, to the good of the, you know, good of the city. And then, and then when I think about people like George Floyd, I mean, he literally sacrificed himself, just literally walk into the store, not doing anything. And it makes me think that our society, we've basically valued lives over others, you know? And, it, and it's very contradictory to hear, you know, people who are supportive of law enforcement when they say all lives matter. And do all lives really matter? Is there an asterisk next to that? So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of things. And I think when it comes to Black communities, I feel like our focus is in so many areas that it's impossible to keep our attention and focus on one issue. When we look at the, um, the journey um, in work, healthcare, all these different areas where our people are disenfranchised, it's impossible to stay focused on one, right? I feel like our people are spread out thin. So for me, I think we've gotten here because of bias, biases, not just racism. I think people have internal biases within the police department. And one thing I, I also wanna highlight and I hope that we talk about tonight is, you know, we talk about our experiences as black men and black women being stopped by, you know, the police, but we also tend to forget that the experiences of black police officers are, are just as bad or even worse. And, you know, I was listening to NPR the other day and you had a retired detective, I think this was like two days ago, come on and talk about like, hey, Brian, I just wanted to let you know I'm retired, but um, as a black man in the NYPD, we're treated as second class. And, and, and this is not just in the NYPD, this is all across the board. You know, and I'm really trying to figure out like, are we, and, I, and I've said this before in the past, I feel like as if our society is built to tolerate racism. When are we gonna have the same zero tolerance approach that we have to controlling crime in marginalized communities to eliminating racism? Thank you. Thank you, I'm gonna to go to Andrea now. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Um, and I want to start off uh, the same way Martha said, like, you know, looking back at the history of this country, uh, how this country was founded, it was find, founded on violence and, and genocide and slavery. And we have to talk about that when it comes to our policing system, how slave catchers were the first form of police and then how that turned into the prison industrial complex and the war on drugs. And so racism is still embedded into our institutions and our systems um, and what it means to, to think, rethink what safety looks like. Cause the narrative is always, you know, the NYPD and police keep us safe, but when you're inflicting violence and harm on our communities, um, that's, not, that's not safety, that's violence, that's harm. Um, when we speak to our young people about what it means for them, what the safety look like to them, it's friends, it's family, it's um, feeling nurtured and being in a holistic environment. And, you don't hear the word police once. Um, and also when you look at how COVID-19 has just impacted our communities, how the fact that in the middle of a pandemic, the, part, the police are interacting with communities in this way and the fact that they're doing it period and the fact that people, uh, folks of color and just have to go out in the middle of a pandemic, risk our health, risk our safety in order to demand justice. Um, so looking at it overall um, and rethinking what safety looks like. Awesome, we're gonna go to Curleen. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a complicated question. A lot of depth, a lot of history behind it. Um, the bottom line is, is that, you know, racism is alive and well. Uh, we have an opportunity right now I think more so than any other time to do something about it, to bring together coalitions of people of many different races who now, even if they hadn't seen it before, now get it. They now get how it feels to see someone getting knocked down by the police just because they're protesting or because they say something. Um, 
And I think that's a lot of the media coverage, like Elaine was speaking about, it's like, it's almost like we're conditioned. We're conditioned to accept racist notions. So we begin to internalize it and, gen and society internalizes it. Um, because one of the things underlying all this violence is, is that the officers are conditioned to believe that black men are dangerous. They're a threat, that they're going to hurt you. And, and that is a notion that's proliferated in the news, in uh, TV, in the movies, in the music, you know? So there's a, there's a lot for us to do. It, and to me, this is not just about the police. That's one thing we can address right now. And that's, that's great, but this is so much bigger. Being involved in the criminal justice system, we've got to do something about the system because, okay, so you, you repeal 50A and okay, so now you can get this officer's records. But if you're doing this trial in front of a judge who routinely finds cops who perjure themselves credible, is it really gonna matter to the judge? that now I can bring in this guy's, this officer's history? Mm -hmm. My fear is that no, it won't make a difference. So the changes that we have to make, like to take this opportunity and seize it, go beyond just what's happening with the police. We have an um, array of systems that are at play and in effect that are contaminated by this disease of racism. And until we, uh, start to to get to work on all of it. I mean, it seems like a big task, right? But it can be done and this is the moment. Like, like the councilman was saying, we have to seize the moment. This is the moment to change policing, to change the criminal justice system, the family court system, the juvenile justice system. It's an opportunity to take a, to sit back and take a look and see where we failed, and move to address it. Now's the time. Awesome, we're gonna to go to Tiffany now. First, I wanna start by saying thank you for having me. Um, I wanna start by saying that we got here because we have a history that involves very disturbing and startling basic human rights violations. And those violations have been enacted in an astonishing scale that includes enslavement, that includes assault, family, separating our families, separating the black men, our fathers from our families, um, murder with impunity, political disenfranchisement dis um, and economic oppression and so we have all a combination of all these things that contributes to our history as America, that contributes to our history as black people. Yet it's a history that as a nation, we some people avoid confronting because it's uncomfortable for them. Whereas it's a reality for us. And it's deeply ingrained, it has deeply ingrained effects. And so in addition to being black, we experience di discrimination in housing, our basic rights as human beings, our housing status, um, age, uh, geographic location, and God forbid you have an arrest or conviction history, you become a bigger target. Um, we, we constantly have to have the conversation. We need to have the conversation. Um, because we're dealing with racism that in other forms of discrimination and oppression that is woven into the fabric of our history, woven into the fabric of the institutions that, that we built for free. And so until we can get on the same page as, as until people can, um, have the conversation in their interpersonal relationships and conversations, then we have made progress, but we can make more progress when you have um, people that are not black advocate and uh, promote our agenda. And I just wanna say one last thing about um, 
arrest and criminal history, I think that it's unfair that um, black and brown men and women are targeted and you get three strikes and you're out, you're in jail for life. But if a police officer is kills three unarmed black or brown individuals, they're still a police officer. And so that same concept where if a criminal gets three, three felonies, they're in, they're in prison for their lifetime, officers should also receive that same, you, even one person, even one unarmed black or brown uh, man or woman being killed should be enough for them to be removed from the police department. Thank you. So I want to play devil's advocate for a minute. I want to go to Adrian quick um, because, you know, the police commissioner has continuously touted community policing. And um, according to the NYPD, they have enacted major reforms um, over the course of the last few years. And New York City and our communities are in a better place. Everything is, is okie dokie. Everything is well. Um, can you speak to um, that a little bit? And then whoever wants to chime in on this, I'm gonna to try to do this like more of a free flow rather than a structured go here, go here. So anybody who wants to hop in to talk about a subject matter is more than, uh, more than welcome to do that. But I just, I, this is what we keep hearing. Community policing changed the face of New York City. Adrian, is that true? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, it all depends on what community you go to because there is no uniform setting for community policing across the city of New York. So where we may experience one thing dealing with our precincts here in Southeast Queens, uh, Brooklyn precincts are experiencing something totally different and completely upside down and it's been okay. It's been okay to continue to beat people in the streets. It's been okay to continue to harass youth. It's been okay to continue to run up on innocent people. It's been okay to continue to run up into NYCHA and do whatever you want to do as an officer, uh, claiming that this is your right and that you're trying to keep the community safe. So if we had just one broad brush uh, with educational intent, across the NYPD, we would be looking at something totally different with one voice, including the community in that voice, uh, having more of uh, the population of that voice than NYPD, by the way. Uh, I think that we would be a lot better off. So there is no one size fits all, and that's been the problem. Back in the day when I was growing up, we had block associations that pretty much were fantastic. They worked in concert, with the police department. And we, in fact, saw more of a family situation uh, back, back in the day, I dare say, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it, you know, in a more uh, a, a compatible situation with the police than we have over the past 20, 30 years now. So, uh, and that really was true community policing, if you ask me. Now, uh, what we're trying to do is go back. But if we don't treat people equally, we can't, uh, we can't go back because if equality is never a part of the equation, then we're just spinning our wheels. Anybody else want to hop in on that? I mean, we all have heard about the NCO meetings. Um, they've been the cure to um, uh, apparently a lot of the disparities and issues. Anybody else want to chime in on this one? I, I'll chime in on that. And, and, you know, I think when we ask the question about community policing, we have to really ask the question of, who's at these particular meetings. And I wanna play devil's advocate because I always keep it a thousand. You know, a lot of people are protesting um, about the treatment that they've been receiving from NYPD officers and, you know, stop and frisk and all these different things. But have any of those individuals who are protesting, have they ever been to a precinct council meeting? You know, we talk about holding officers accountable and there's a space that's there and a lot of people don't show up to those meetings the same ways that they don't show up to vote. And that's, I'm just keeping it a thousand and that's all the way hundred. And to be honest, it's not just the police officers who are holding bias against particular individuals that are in our community. It's individuals in our community who literally have these particular mindsets to men of color and it's people of color as well. And if we're gonna be real, we're gonna need to address that because I've been to a precinct council meeting. I'm not gonna say which precinct it was, but I heard some very disturbing things in these particular meetings. 
So if we're not having these types of conversations uh, at the precinct council meeting and outside of it with um, an intergenerational lens approach, then how are we expecting for police officers to uh, really listen to us about our treatment? Because literally what they're doing is they're listening to the community, all right? They're listening to the people who show up to those meetings. And that's, that's a real issue. And, and, I, and I also wanna mention, um, I know that we spoke about like, you know, how we got here. And, and I think it's important for us to actually talk about how all of these different things are connected. You know, Dr. Tricia Rose from Brown University, um, she has a video on YouTube and she explains how structural racism works. And I implore anybody to watch that video. And basically her video talks about, well, her project rather examines the uh, connections between policies and practices in housing, uh, education and other key spheres of uh, society to uh, reveal the intersectional and uh, compounding effects of um, systemic discrimination as a significant force in American society. And until we have those critical and courageous conversations in the community as a collective, there's no way that we're gonna see reform. We're gonna have to keep waiting until more bodies hit the floor for us to get, get to the point. But change can come if we collectively work towards it. Can I just jump in on, on that uh, from a communication standpoint? Elaine, I agree with you, um, but from a communication standpoint, um, I wanna just highlight how the NYPD is doing outreach, right? So if we wanna have, if we wanna have a real conversation and we really wanna bridge the gap where um, we are trying to, I'll use uh, cure violence, for example, where we wanna have the cure violence conversation and get our youth out of gangs and, and, and involve them into other activities and, um, build the gap between our officers and our communities, we also have to take a look at how we're reaching them, right? So if you want to reach the youth that are most impacted and influenced by gun violence and they think it's cool to use a gun, we have to go to where they are, right? Not everyone, and this is no attack, but we, you know, not everyone is on social media. So if the NYPD is using Twitter and uh, Instagram and press releases online, if we're talking about communities that lack access to internet, not only that, which we've seen over the pandemic, mm -hmm. they don't, some communities don't have mobile devices or computers and iPads to even access that digital information, right? So we have, they have to go into the communities, go to those basketball courts, go to where they're hanging out, go to those NYCHA developments and not aggressively. Look at, they have to look at how they approach us. And I think a lot of the reason, a lot of the problem is they don't know how to approach us. And I think that every, um, every police officer should be required to, I know they have to have certain college credits, but they should be required to have a degree and be required to take certain classes on, um, on race and culture. And just like certain degree, certain majors are required to take certain classes to get a degree. I was required to take intro to public relations to get a public relations degree. They should be required to take intro to public safety, intro to culture, and and race and you know and but the thing is that's common sense you shouldn't have to take a class to learn to know how to treat people i, I and, and the, yeah let's stay there for a second should new york city officers be um, should police depart should nypd officers be required to live in new york city i'm interested in anybody's opinion on that i, I just want to jump in and say and, and i agree with everything that tiffany said and i think no matter if you're from uh, the city or not, you have internal biases. We all have internal biases about particular individuals. And I honestly do, um, you know, going to John Jay, I, I've, went to, I've went to school with a lot of cops. A lot of, a lot of my good friends are actually high up there. And, you know, when we talk about culturally responsive education, I think the DOE has done some amazing stuff 
um, when it comes to culturally responsive. Everything's not perfect, but I think we would have to sit down together and collectively build a curriculum that we feel comfortable with. Um, I think, you know, and I totally get it that there's different means of communication, right? Some people have snail mail, emails, this, that, and the third. And there are, there are uh, communities that are marginalized or don't have access to certain things. But I think the question that I, I wanna ask to everybody else is, at what point do you hold people accountable, right? Because for me, my philosophy, and, and this is just me personally, the way I move is I know at the end of the day, when we all look at our paychecks, we're taxed three times. I think we're taxed the most out of anybody in the country, right? We get federal taxes, state taxes, and city. That's right. So for me, when I hear young brothers who say, you know, the, the, the urban term like, hey, Alan, I'm about my money. How can you be about your money, but you don't vote and understand how your tax money is being spent? It don't make no sense, right? At some point, where do we hold people accountable now? You know, because honestly, the, the quality of life is in our hands and we could decide certain things. But at the, at the end of the spectrum though, I think there's been a history of particular individuals um, being shut out of these spaces and literally ha it has basically eroded the trust. So there's a history of this particular government who has basically preyed on people of color and it's documented if anybody wants to research it. They've been preying on people of color and now people of color have said, you know what? I don't want, I don't want to touch this anymore because it doesn't make sense for me to be involved. What's the point if I can get the results? So I'll awesome. jump in. Yeah. I'll jump in. Um, so, you know, to your point, um, so our office, Queens Defenders, is a public defender's office, right? So that means we represent you know, people in the county of Queens who are charged with crimes. And so what we realized, though, in working with our clients, and especially our young people, is that we had to figure out a way to bridge a, 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 the gap or build some sort of relationship with the police in their community. Because the thinking was, like, if we could build relationships and the police begin to see them as, you know, kids, human, same feelings, you know, making the same mistakes they made when they were young, right? That, that then we can move forward, then maybe they police differently. And I think we've been able to do that um, at our outreach center. Our young people are comfortable going to the precinct and inviting the cops to come and have a conversation, come and play a game, uh, you know, let's do basketball. So, I mean, and, and it's not necessarily an easy thing as a public defender's office to say like, try to connect with the cops. But I mean, it's just the realization that we've tried a lot of other things and it's not working. And it depends on the willingness, obviously, of the officers in the precinct. And we've been very fortunate that the, the officers we've dealt with, you know, like at the 101, the 100, the 103rd, have been receptive to like having an, another way of looking at things. And some of the officers have even asked us to go with them to schools to speak to kids because it's a hard conversation for them to have. And so we go with them and we sort of smooth the way so that you know the young people are comfortable and engaged. And some of our young people now want to be cops. So, you know, it's it's there's so much to it, but um, I guess we've taken a position that we just can't give up and we have to try as best we can to build some bridges and, and we're doing it because it's our kids who get affected. It's our kids who get stopped. But you know, it's a different scenario when the cops know you and they know your name and, and they know where you work. Um, you know, so it's so different. And should the cops live here? It would definitely cut down on some of what I've heard from officers who've told me, you know, they leave and they go home to Nassau because the animals live here in Queens and they can escape the zoo. Literally, this has been said to me by an officer, they can escape the zoo and go home. And maybe if they lived in the community, got to know the community, they might have a different impression. You know, as it is, they, they drop in, they run away. You know, so maybe if you had an actual stake in the community, that really might actually make a difference. Awesome. And I, I wanna I wanna hop into that. Let's let's go into so there's been a, a movement and you know, obviously there's been some negative connotation around these words, defund the police. Um, I wanna go to Martha and Andrea to start that conversation. You know, what what is this thing about? You know, uh, 
Are we talking about abolishing the police department or, or is there a need for the police department on New York City streets? Um, uh, you know, I, I'm interested in hearing what are your thoughts and anybody else who wants to chime in, but um, you know, is there, you know, what does this mean? Do we need to redistribute funded? Do we need police on our streets? Um, what are you hearing or you're a part of these conversations? What does it mean to you? So we'll start with Andrea and then we'll go to Martha and then we'll open it up. You know, should we defund the New York City Police Department? I know there's been a lot of conversation. I know Adrian and I have been um, point and center on a lot of conversation around cutting the New York City Police Department's budget by a billion dollars this year. Um, you know, will that change things? Or is it just we're cutting money and you know, all of a sudden, the, the police department, all of it, all of a sudden, overnight, is just the greatest thing walking on our streets. Um, so, Andrea, we'll go to you first, and then we'll go to um, Martha. But you know, there's a lot of fear around this word defund. What does it mean? Clarify it if you're supportive of it. Yeah. So this is work that um, us as an organization, the Rock Reef Task Force, we've been saying for years, and I think it's just now becoming a little more digestible for people. Um, but what it means to defund um, or divest from the NYPD and from the police is to take money from the police department. We're asking for at least a billion dollars, which the city council has proposed, um, and to invest, reinvest it into our community. So in our schools, our hospitals, transportation, healthcare, like all the resources that, that black and brown communities are so under-resourced in and invest in those things because we know that that's what creates um, a better, more safer, supportive community for us. Um, and like something very specific when it comes to defunding the police that um, we've been saying for years is to get police out of schools. We know that um, police in schools disproportionately um, criminalize and impact uh, black and brown students across the city. Um, and it leads to arrests. School should be a, a safe haven, a place where you feel safe. Um, and where you're not arrested or given a summons for, for normal youth behavior when you know that's not happening in predominantly white schools. Um, and so that's something we're really pushing for right now. One, to just divest at least a billion dollars from the NYPD. And the, the whole point of defund that's left out of that hashtag is to invest, um, invest in our communities, in our schools, our hospitals, our local infrastructure. Uh, mental health support, uh, homelessness services, affordable housing, all the things our communities need um, while divesting from the harmful and violent uh, like structure, the NYPD uh, that's affecting our community. And like I said, one of those things is getting, cop um, getting cops out of schools. Um, and so that, that's what we're really trying to do right now. Um, it happened in Minneapolis uh, where the school board voted to end their terminate their contract with the police department um, in Denver. And we are hoping that it happens here. We're, we're fighting for it to happen here in New York City and not just necessarily uh, um, passing over that to the DOE, um, but actually getting police out of schools and investing in restorative justice, guidance counselors, social workers, mental health support, um, better textbooks, um, just things that our community and our schools really need. So that's really the idea behind divesting um, and defunding and then investing in our communities. Let's go to Martha now on that one. Um, I was thinking a lot about what Alan said about uh, accountability and um, I wouldn't be uh, a good progressive if I didn't hold my other white progressives accountable. Um, it's unfortunate that the Black Lives Matter movement has been co-opted by white progressives. And I caution to a lot of folks that if you are participating and you are doing an action, look up the organization, look up the group, make sure that their board members are black or of color. Uh, if you are donating, make sure that it is actually going to people of color. Uh, there's been a lot of money that's been invested into uh, urban leagues and NAACPs when there's a lot of local groups that do it on like for real, like the Rockway Youth Task Force, uh, the Communities for Police Reform, um, and then just investing in our local groups that do this work all the time, 24 seven with very little resources or a lot of volunteers. Um, the other accountability that I wanna talk about is the seniors. Um, and this cycle of, you know, why the police act the way they do. And there has to be an acknowledgement of the fact that 
these seniors that are going to the police uh, precinct councils are the ones complaining to NYPD who do have this ageist attitude that these young people are causing problems and these young people are the ones that are you know, compromising their safety. And that's the other part of the conversation is what is safety to you? You know, and obviously there's a huge generational divide as to what is safety, because as a woman, you know, obviously I'm concerned about being raped. I'm concerned about, um, you know, identity theft. I'm uh, concerned about my Amazon package being stolen versus a senior citizen who at any point in time, day or night can always talk about their safety, which is this like mysterious shadow in a corner, which ends up being the black man. Um, and sometimes it is our own community that does it to ourselves. But getting back to the defunding of police, um, this hashtag has been something that's been trending and it's, you know, become kind of like a Twitter thing as opposed to something that's actually real. And I think that's where Andrea is trying to, you know, stress is that defunding police is not just like getting rid of cops and this crazy Bernie leftist uh, DSA you know, mantra of like, like, no, we're not talking about getting rid of police. There's no way that we can ever get rid of police, but turning them into like community care workers or giving them more time to have schooling in social work and figuring out ways to deescalate and stop treating them as these like, you know, catching the bad guys because the bad guys look like us committing crimes that don't actually exist anymore. The robberies, the murders and the rapes that happened in the eighties and nineties that a lot of seniors still have PTSD about don't exist. You know, we are in a different society. We've evolved, you know, like I'm more worried about my identity being stolen and like them taking my whole, all my money out of my account. That's more likely to happen than, you know, me being robbed in a sense, like what is crime to you, but also, you know, who's having the conversation with police and there's that generational divide. They're not talking to people who are under 40 who are actually being the ones stopped and frisked and questioned by police. And that is because we don't vote, we don't participate. So it's on us like, yeah, it's cute for you to show up at a protest and hold a sign and hold a piece, but you're not actually participating in local government. So you can't have it both ways. If you want something to change, you have to show up and you have to come to your local community board and you have to talk to people of color, go find some like other people that don't look like you, other like hipsters, and get to know your neighbors and get to know why they're so upset. You know, there has to be this community dialogue that even, you know, we're out not having with ourselves because we're like all in Twitter or all on Instagram that doesn't actually exist in the public. You know, it's like, you know, they were saying that, you know, there's different platforms, but it's not reality. And I think that's the other thing that like, we have to understand, like there's the hashtag and then there's the reality of defunding NYPD. Thank you. I, mean, I want to go. We've been joined by. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Adrian. Go ahead. I, I just want to jump because because you know Martha said so many profound things. Um, Thank you, Council Member. <laughs> I, oh, it, it's just you know, but it really hits home, Martha, because um, you know we've we. I said it earlier, we've been through so much over the past few weeks. And now a lot of us, and over the past few weeks, a lot of us are being, you know, trolled on Twitter for the way that we feel about certain things or not feeling the way about certain things, you know, for wanting to join certain bandwagons. And, and my perspective still is, you all know me, still is, let's get it all out there before we knee jerk and get all emotional about something and make mistakes. That's not the way that we need to be behaving ever. You know, and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, when I hear, well, you need to be more emotional. I'm very emotional. You all know that. Give me a megaphone. I'm just saying. But when it comes to our business and the business of saving lives, the business of quote unquote defunding and all of the rest of these great things, we've got be really serious about what we're talking about, the plan that is in action, because we like to do this emotional stuff with no plan. I don't work like that. We have to have a plan as a people in action, something that makes sense. This is too important to give this away to folks that want us to govern by hashtag. I refuse to do that. I'll say it to you all out here. I don't govern by hashtag. That's not the way that I operate. You give me some, 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 some tangible things to work with some intelligent things to work with for our people, for our community, give us a plan, put all of our brilliant heads together and let's get this done. 
So Martha, I agree with you 100%. Be very careful about who you're following out there because you may be following the wrong person and the wrong people and the, and the wrong group and have the very, very right intentions. Let's go to Brad Landa. He's been an ally on many issues around economic justice. And I think you're coming right at the right time um, because we've had a lot of allies. And it's, you know, there's, there's sort of been this um, silent sort of divide, I, I would say, right? Unspoken divide, I guess is the word um, that, I, that I'm thinking of when it comes to sort of allies being a part of this conversation um, and how do we preserve public safety? And I know you care deeply about all of these things. You've always been on the right side of history, but how do we sort of work with um, organizations that may not be rooted in our communities who, who are you know, sending us a thousand emails, you know, per hour on these different issues. Um, so I just want to hear a little bit more of what are you hearing around the word defund? What does it mean to you? Um, and why, why is there such negative connotation around this word um, at the moment? Unmute yourself, Brad. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you. I mean, there needs to be a word for that when you talk while you're muted. Um, First, I want to say thank you. I really want to enter this conversation with some humility. Um, you know, I think it's got to be challenging for Black Americans to, at this moment, just see all these white people trying to figure out how to talk about racial justice and chant Black Lives Matter. And I, I'm imagining it feels like, on the one hand, good to see people in the streets and see some of the changes in the polls, but also to be scratching your head thinking like, you know, a lot of people were killed before George Floyd and Breonna Taylor like you had all the evidence, how could it be that you didn't see this before? So how could we really trust you honestly see it now? And especially with all those you know, young people who I think feel passionate desire for change, but they're not grounded in history or tradition or leadership. So, so I just, I, I'm trying to spend a lot of time listening right now, even as somebody who's been around a little more, just to make sure like I'm, you know, and I feel lucky, look, I, I've had the chance to listen uh, to folks like Donovan and Adrian, you know, I remember the speech that Donovan gave on the floor uh, the night we voted for the Community Safety Act to end discriminatory stop and frisk and, um, you know, and, and speak for a minute a little less as a council member and a little more like a young man who's grown up with a bunch of friends in that neighborhood. And, and then I remember Adrian also came in, like, I think her first meeting was when we were dealing with some uh, policing issues and spoke with the kind of passion of like, I know the family members, the mothers of people who have been killed, John Bell's family, you know, and, and look, that's just like not my experience and not, not most white people's experience. So, you know, starting with just like trying to listen, um, not let yourself off the hook, you know, I think you can also pull too far away from the conversation. So, so that's not easy, and, and it's a lot easier than, than facing knowing if you could go out every day, you know, you might get harassed or assaulted or killed. Um, but, it, you know, it's a step we're all taking. And, and, you know, look, it's still, when people, with the defund word, you know, I think you hear, like, uh, I hear Adrian for sure with this, like, are we going to rush too fast and do things in an unconsidered way? But, you know, I will also say, if you just look at American history, you know, we failed to do enough a whole lot more times than we than we did too much. So how do we try to show up thoughtfully um, and following also bring our communities along? I got a lot of people who are sitting with a lot of privilege and maybe because the world is being kind of cracked open, they can see it. But but how to relate to that, how to think about what that means. We need really intentional conversation. And I guess what I'm trying to do when I ask people about it is to ask them to think about the situations in which we send cops and what the implications of that are. You know, one of the first meetings I ever had on this was when Hawa Ba uh, came to tell me what happened the night that uh, her son Mohammed was, you know, having a mental health crisis. And she called 911 and said, please send an ambulance. Um, and what showed up at her door were cops. And she said, no, no, I didn't call the cops. I called the ambulance, you go away. And those cops broke down the door and killed Muhammad. And, you know, we, if you think about every time someone's in uh, mental health distress or every time someone calls because they're facing domestic violence, you know, and, 
you know, maybe one in 20 of those times, there's some risk of violence. And yet every one of those times, we send cops to respond. And so, uh, you know, so to me, like, that's what this conversation can open up is just a more profound thinking about what gives people safety, um, what gives people safety in my community as well as, as your community. And, and it's not mostly knowing a cop is going to come break down your door in a crisis. And how could we reinvent our communities and our thinking about public safety with the things that make us feel safe at the center? Um, that would be pretty profound. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes I ask the question, think about like the last 10 times you saw a, an NYPD officer and how many of them do you really think it was necessary to have someone with a gun and handcuffs whose tools are in arrest and incarceration and if the answer is, I don't know, one or two, maybe three, then you're saying, I think we could have a whole lot smaller uh, policing presence in our city. And if you're hearing from people in Black communities and listening right now about what's going on, maybe you have a responsibility to try to show up as an ally for that. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to do. And I feel grateful to be able to do it with partners like Adrian and Donovan and the Rockaway Youth Task Force and Communities United for Police Reform. Um, and that's what I'm encouraging my constituents and my, uh, my neighbors and my kids to try to figure out how to do. Thank you, Brad. I wanna to go to Caroline quick. Um, so 50A was recently repealed and I'm interested in hearing, you know, how substantial was this? Do you think this is gonna make a difference um, specifically around um, more transparency and accountability um, within the department. So you sort of alluded to it. And if you could just explain for the public, those who are watching uh, what 50A is, um, that would be good in a, you know, in a concise okay. way. And yeah. <laughs> do you really think this is going to make a difference? Okay. So 50A was a law that pretty much protected the New York uh, City Police Department uh, from having the personnel files of the individual officers be released. So for example, the officer who killed uh, Eric Garner, right? If you, you wanted to get Pantaleo's history, you wanted to see had he you know, victimized anybody else? Had he been reported for it? What happened to that? Um, what other infractions has he committed as officer? You could not get that information. So with the repeal of 50A, we now have access to get an officer's um, disciplinary history. You can get his personnel history. And so then that way you'd be able to see, is there a pattern of abuse by this officer? And then obviously then you would use it in court. You would confront this officer with it. And that literally can affect the way that his testimony is viewed, right? Because as it stands now, uh, officers, like I said, are given a level of credibility that, I mean, sometimes defies logic. Sometimes their testimony is so incredible but you will always hear the words, I deem his testimony to be credible. But at least I think now, if, if we're able to get this, even if a judge doesn't accept it, jurors will listen to it. It will have more of an impact with jurors when they hear about this incident, the third incident, the fourth incident, the fifth. You have to hand it to the NYPD's union, okay? Because I've gotten some histories, right? Because sometimes we're able to look some of these things up. And I mean, you just wonder how does this person still have a job? How does this person still have a job with all these infractions? How is this possible? You know, so that's something that has to be changed. Like, I guess when we negotiate the next contract, we're gonna have to really look at the protections that we're giving these officers that your regular citizen just would not have, okay? I couldn't go out and commit five different infractions and still have this job. I could not, but they can. They can kill someone and say it was, I was working as a police officer. They get sued. I pay for it. The New York City taxpayer pays for every infraction that they have, especially when it results in a lawsuit and there's money damages, I'm paying for it. Now, my company would say to me, especially after the first one, you're done. Not the NYPD. And point of information, I know Alain wanted to hop in on this. Yeah. I think FY18, NYPD spent over $230 million in misconduct settlements. Um, and then last year, I think it was almost to around that, that amount as well, almost $240 million or so paid out again last year. So you think about all of the 
things we need to pay for. Um, but this, the lack of transparency certainly enabled these officers to in the city to pay out these settlements, your taxpayer dollars, while we're talking about cutting the summer youth employment program and other programs, exactly. money that are being reinvested back into communities. So, Alain, I'm going to let you go. Oh, I, I had a quick question to Ms. Joseph and then a comment for the for the for, I just cl a clarification because I didn't understand like 50A. So is it that all disciplinary records are open and that we can have access to them or are they are they just open for when a judge needs them or not? So we would have to I mean, from what I know, we'd have to um, file a FOIL application and request the information to and then get the information. But I'll tell you. In, in practice, in, in the real world, sometimes, you know, we, we've tried to get information through FOIL and it is difficult and you have to keep refiling and refiling because they put up so many obstacles to get it. So that also has to be addressed because it's one thing to say, okay, yeah, now you can apply for it, you can request it. But the thing is, am I gonna really get the information? Hmm. Am I gonna get it? And so when it's FOIL, I believe it's open to anybody. It doesn't just have to deal with the judge. You, you know, your I, average citizen can make a FOIL request. Thank you. I really thank you for that um, clarification. You know, I've been really thinking about 50A and how in how aggressive it is. I, I think one of the things that the NYPD doesn't want us to have, and this is my personal opinion, they don't want us to have access to all those files because I've heard from Black police officers personally that if we were to get access to all those files and put together the data points it would show that black police officers are punished more than white police officers. And for me, when I hear, I, I think what it is when we say defund the police, the NYPD has a public relations division that it's so good at spinning things. And literally they want us to, it's basically fear mongering. They want us to be in fear and say, oh my, you can't defund the police. What's gonna happen in your community? You might get killed, you, got, you might get mugged all these different kinds of different things. And for me, um, I think that the privilege of police officers is under attack and they don't want that to change. They don't want their privileges to go. And I think it's kind of disheartening and it's sad that you would have all these uh, um, union presidents gather together for the NYPD and basically complain about oh my God, you guys are treating us like thugs and this, that, and the third. And I'm like, bro, like we've been getting treated like this for I don't know how long, since I was a kid. But now you guys are getting the treatment that people of color have been getting this whole time. I guess it doesn't feel too good, you know? Uh, I think it's just rather insulting. I think, and I'm gonna go back, I started off with this and I'm gonna keep reiterating this fact. We need to create a space where good police officers are protected. Too many examples of good police officers, they call out some of these egregious behaviors and they end up getting punished. There's too many examples for that. That's it. I just wanna add that I read, I listened to a podcast where they discussed a model in another city where um, police officers were, all of the police officers in that city were let go and they had to reapply for their positions. And I think New York can learn from that where if <laughs> I am confident that if majority of the police officers in New York City were fired or let go and had to reapply, given the status and state of their records, whether we can see it or not, they will not be able to be police officers. And I think New York, New York can learn from other models where we require our officers to, um, to either reapply or some type of um, system that just like a uh, driver's license, I'll use driver's license for example, uh, if your license is suspended, you have to reapply to get your driver's license. And so if you're a police officer and you constantly receive, um, you, you're constantly, you constantly abuse your authority, you should automatically be fired. Um, and if New York did implement a model where all police officers were required to reapply for their positions, certain applications should be red flagged. Like you are not 
going to be reinstated as a police officer. And so I think we can learn from um, other other agencies, other cities, and other police departments. Just, just I just think we just need to. We there's certain things that we just need to start over. And that city was Camden, I believe, New Jersey. Um, anybody studied the model, Brad? Do you do you know anything about the Camden, New Jersey model um, that could be duplicated? Now their police force is much smaller than us than ours. Um, I had family in Camden. I knew it led the the country at one time in the murder in the murder rate. It was a very dangerous place. Uh, maybe two or three or four years ago, um, they they seem to it seems to keep that city seems to keep coming up over and over again. Uh, Brian Lira show last week also um, spoke about the Camden, New Jersey model. Are there things in that model we should duplicate in New York City? Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, Tiffany got at a lot of it and, and you did as well. And that's now, you know, uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, and, you know, they've had good uh, results, although I will say, I think there's an ambition to think even even further. They um, did that uh, process of rehiring, but not necessarily the process of thinking, what are the things we could do with public safety strategies that are not policing? Um, and I think that, like, uh, I think some folks will have seen that Minneapolis, just the city council there, and things are, you know, what happened there really is, I mean, the Minneapolis Police Department in some ways has dismantled itself. Um, that has long been a department that really did not, you know, the, the council tried to do a lot of reforms, the, the, the department has not made them, and in the wake of the four officers being fired and indicted, they just kind of like stopped working, uh, really have gone sort of rogue, and that's also much smaller, I think they have 888 officers, but they're talking about a process that I think builds on what Camden did, like opens up the contract, builds these new procedures in, but then also really looks at all these other systems. Can we put your violence models at the center? Can we change how we respond to mental health uh, distress? Can we change how we respond in cases of uh, domestic violence reports so that they sort of combine what Camden is doing with this more transformative restructuring approach and try not only to come back with uh, maybe different officers, but also with a lot fewer um, and a, a different infrastructure of public safety. Um, one other thing, just because this gets at something that uh, you were both saying, I know in the, in the bill that the House of Representatives introduced last week, they're looking at a national registry to deal with this problem that in some cases, when you've had an officer uh, get fired from one department, they could just pack up and move you know, to the next county over uh, and get hired because there's nothing that, you know, it's sort of like what 50A is for, for New York State. There's nothing like that nationally. Um, so, I mean, that'll take, uh, you know, uh, action in Washington, but obviously is, is one important part of this here as well. Could I, could I ask a question to the councilman? Sure. Um, you know, when it comes to defunding the police, you know, one thing that I hear from, you know, whenever something happens with a police officer, when they get accused of racism or they're on video, they get caught doing something, it's like the knee jerk reaction um, is to say, oh, they need more training. And honestly, personally, I'm tired of hearing that. We always go back to, oh, they just need more training. And for me personally, I don't think you can retrain a mind that's been socially conditioned to dislike a particular, a particular race. And for me, one of the things that I have, the questions that I have about the NYPD, and I've brought this up at a precinct council meeting, and of course, everybody was like a deer in headlights and couldn't answer my question. My question is, is when they send police officers or NYPD officers specifically to these particular trainings, who's controlling the curriculum? Who's the vendor that chooses the curriculum, you know, in terms of race relations? You know, we always just send police officers to training. I've never seen what the curriculum is. Who's running that? Is it culturally responsive? These are the questions that I have. I'm tired of us spending tax dollars on trainings that don't work. It's just a check in the box. When are we gonna start designing our own trainings that are effective? That's a, that's a loaded question. And I know even for the NTO program, you know, uh, you know, one of the things we requested is how do we know this program is working? What are the metrics? Who is, who is, 
who who is um, a, a, who are they reporting to? How do you know that the NCOs are actually accomplishing what they're supposed to? And then we found out the Rand Corporation was doing the study, and I'm just like the Rand Corporation, you know. So there there are so many different scenarios on that, and and I quite frankly agree with you on the training. The bottom line is um, there has to be accountability, and that's where we sorely lacked. Um, you could train as much as you want, but if there's no consequences to your actions whether it's foul language, right? Which is something commonly used in our communities as well. Shut up. I mean, I, I one time, you know, as a council staffer, watch police officers. I, I just stood there to, to listen and they were cursing at a man. I mean, is that the sort of folks we want on our streets? While it may seem small, right? Oh, they just cursed at him. No, it's, 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 it speaks to a larger issue. Um, one of the things, the bills we will pass this week is something I've worked on for over a year, a discipline matrix which is going to finally create a framework in the department require the police commissioner to come up with a framework around guidelines around discipline. If I got in a fight in elementary school, you knew what the repercussions were, right? You knew if you got in a fight with Joey or whoever his name was, um, that you were gonna be suspended for five days. In the NYPD, there are no guidelines around this. You know, it's whatever the commissioner um, thinks the level of discipline should be. There's no um, set disciplinary matrix like other cities have. Um, so if he wakes up in a bad mood, he may say, you know what, I'm, I'm docking your pay for seven days. He may, and, and, it, and it's real. I think the way you discuss the disparities of how officers of color are treated opposed to officers, white shirts, right? We hear white shirt immunity often. Um, there is a difference, but the matrix helps to level the playing field because everybody has that one standard um, that they have to adhere to when it comes to discipline. And then we also obviously have to later have a conversation. I mean, should the NYPD be holding their own internal trials? I mean, should that be something somebody else is doing? How if the police should not police themselves. It has not worked historically, right? Um, but right now, just as we saw in the Garner case or in, in other cases, you have to go sit in the NYPD's administrative, you know, chambers, right? and go through these trials, um, you know, and I think it's absurd that there's not an independent body um, overseeing these trials. Um, and also uh, the, the police commissioner at this moment has sole discretion on discipline. So even when the civilian complaint review boards um, substantiates a complaint, uh, the police commissioner at the end of the day, they can recommend, you know, we believe this officer deserves to be suspended without pay for eight days or a week or a month. But the commissioner can overrule them. So in this disciplinary matrix bill, they're going to be required to, um, if they digress from the CCRB's um, uh, recommendation, the police commissioner will now be required to, to have a written reason why he um, changed that, you know, why he decreased the level of um, discipline that they would have would have faced. So that those are some unique things that I think we can have here. And I'm gonna come back to you, Brad, but I wanna to go to a, um, uh, Andrea quick because there's been a lot of discussion around school safety um, being removed from the NYPD. And I know this is something your agency has, I mean, your, your, your specific organization has been working on. Um, should the NYPD and school safety part ways? We're seeing a movement around the country. Will our schools still be safe? Um, if the uh, school safety agents are taking out of the NYPD? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, this is work we've been doing for years, um, calling for the removal of police in schools. Um, and I think it can be easy to say, um, let's move it from the, from the NYPD jurisdiction to the DOE. Um, but it's, that can easily just become still a very oppressive and criminalizing um, system for young people and students. And so when we say police out of schools, we say police out of schools, um, also metal detectors um, and what that looks like to take, to take that funding and invest it into, like I was saying before, guidance counselors, social workers, restorative justice programs, because restorative justice uh, for all was um, citywide was announced last year and now it's, it's in limbo, you know, with all these budget cuts, are we still going, is the program still going to exist? Um, investing in mental health support, uh, social workers, um, and those resources that a lot of schools, um, underfunded schools don't see is what really would create a safe 
um, a safe community. Um, when we talk about restorative justice, really getting to the root of issues um, and understanding the reason why um, a student may have talked back to a teacher or why a student was late to class. Um, or, you know, people like to talk about the extreme, like if there's a fight, um, is it because, you know, at home you uh, are working like night shifts because you have to support your family. So like really getting to the root cause of issues um, and addressing that and not just using policing as the number, as a number one response. Um, you know, I went to Beach Channel High School. I saw a lot of police in my schools, a lot of police presence. Um, I remember after what happened in um, Parkland, there was like armed officers uh, in my school. And we know that at that time, that's not what students need. We need guidance counselors, mental health support. And so that's what we're really calling for, police out of schools and not just the switching jurisdiction and management over to the DOE, um, but removing police from schools and investing in those resources that our young people really need and have been calling for for years. Adrian, you want to chime in on that? And I know Curleen um, uh, also could chime in on this. The Queens Defenders have recently um, uh, enacted a community court in the Rockaways. So I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about, um, you know, how is that program and framework going to uh, help to alleviate, um, you know, kids from going into the system, certainly. What does that look like? And, and Adrian, you know, certainly want you to follow up on what Andrea said, you know, there's been a great debate around this. Um, should we remove metal detectors out of schools? Does it, does it mean our kids are less safe? Uh, where do we need to go from here? So I'll start with Adrian and then move to Curlin. And then I'm gonna go back to Brad for his point. So he should hold it for a second. You know, it's, it really is, uh, it's, it's such an important issue. Um, when metal, detector, metal detection first came into our school some years ago, we started really taking a look at, um, <laughs> we talk about, you know, the, the, the pipeline, you know, jails pipeline or whatever. This really did put a face to that. Um, it really in criminalizing our children that we are sworn to educate. So even on its face, it's deplorable. Uh, the feeling that a lot of us have in work, walking into our places that are there to educate our students, uh, you know, you feel like you're walking into a prison. And, and if I, I feel that way as an adult, as an education advocate, um, before I was an elected official, if, if I have felt that way over these many years that I'm walking into a prison instead of uh, a place of education for our kids, I can only imagine what that feels like, you know, for the children that we are supposed to be educating, training to become successful human beings, uh, you know, and to elevate to their highest degree of self. So um, my lighting is going, I've, I've really got, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so, you know, I, 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 don't, uh, I, I don't like it. Um, it's, uh, again, it is more of the- Adrian, uh, you're starting to look like the ghost. I know, I know. <laughs> Let me just pull this down because I'm looking at myself and I'm not even seeing myself. The sun is shining through my, through my windows. So let me just do a little bit of that. So, you know, again, when we really take a look at our schools that are supposed to be there, you know, beacons of excellence and beauty for our children, this is supposed to be what we're supposed to be projecting to them. And instead, they're really walking into, um, as a, a lot of us have said, uh, education advocates in the past have said, if this is the look of our children now, our schools look like prison now, this is really setting the blueprint for their future. And I dare say this is not the the uh, the setting that we want for our kids. So the metal detectors, you know, no. Uh, and as far as um, police, I agree a hundred percent. You know, with Andrea, police in schools again, it goes along with the criminalization of our black and brown children. And it, if nothing else, what is that doing to their psyche? What is that that doing to them psychologically? walking into their schools and already being treated like criminals when they're there to learn. So I, I think it's abhorrent and I think it's deplorable. I defer to Curl Curleen. You're on mute. 
Yeah, you're on mute, Curleen. I could not agree with you both more. The police have to go um, because er for every reason that you guys have stated, but the additional reason that we saw is that um, so something happens, there's a fight, that child is arrested, that child is suspended. And so, you know, the whole disruption of the education when the child is suspended and, and sometimes for things that are minor, that restorative justice, as Andrea was saying, could resolve. You could sit with those young people and resolve that and find out what are the underlying reasons. And so, in some of the schools, uh, like I go to Beach Channel, and that is an armed encampment. That is just ridiculous. Um, but from that program, we had the, the idea of starting the community court because we we saw that in the high schools, when you use restorative justice and you allow the students to participate in the process, they came up with sanctions that were actually useful and were able to support a young person in completing their education rather than being suspended or getting arrested. And so we're just taking that notion now and expanding it to the community where uh, we're gonna be given cases um, in conjunction with the DA's office and the local precincts of people who commit offenses. And our goal is to restore them in the community. And, by, and the way we're gonna do that is by hooking them up with some of the local businesses um, so that they can do internships rather than sweeping the sidewalk. They're gonna actually do something that they're interested in, that's meaningful, that, that could potentially lead to a, a longer internship, could lead to a job, but also restores their dignity. They have, they made a mistake and, and they will atone for that mistake and grow and develop in the community. And they can then become one of the leaders in the community because we've seen the same thing at the high schools. When we have students come into our program in the high schools, those same students stay, they come with an infraction, they learn how our youth court works and then they stay and they become a leader and they train other kids. We're trying to do the same thing in the community for not only young people, but it goes up, you know, it, can, it will also involve adults as well. Um, so we're there to give opportunities to people in the community of the Rockaways um, to give them opportunities that they have not had, you know, if you, um, because our system as it stands, you have a conviction, there are all these collateral consequences that come with any conviction, housing, loans, you know, um, immigration. I mean, the list goes on. And so we're trying to do something about that now. We're trying to hook people up with the services that they will need so that they no longer end up back in the criminal justice system. Can I just quickly and, make- and, point? Oh, go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, so um, this, is, this really comes down to um, dismantling the school to prison pipeline. Um, there's a pipeline for, for black and Latinx students in New York City. Um, to be criminalized and end up in our criminal legal system. And just to give context really quickly, um, about 60 Black and Latinx students make up 63% of the New York City school population, but um, about 98% of those arrested and given a summons. So it really comes to show that disparity um, when it comes to the, the policing in our schools. And that's why it's such a it's it's always been time, but right now is really the time to to get uh, police out of out of schools, not just out of the hands of the NYPD and move to the DOE, but completely get police out of schools and invest in those um, those resources that we need. And I want to go to Martha now. You know, uh, I know you led a, a protest the other day uh, last week. I feel like I went to seven last weekend. Um, but you led a very important uh, protest. And this movement has largely been comprised of a lot of young people I've seen stepping out. And it was a very um, pointed editorial, I forgot who wrote it yesterday in the New York Times, um, on is this the uh, end of uh, black elected officials leading? Very pointed, which was a great, but you know, I, I had to look past the title and, and read the article. Is this the end of your, your um, the, the standard leadership that we see um, normally responding to these things. I, I mean, I've seen teenagers, I, I mean, lead close to 700 people last week. I know you started to see that and it's being done in a much more organic way. I, I, could, I mean, I don't even know how I get the flyers half the time. I'm like, wow, 
there's no leadership attached to these things. It's just people rising up. I was in Long Island City last week and a young lady by the name of Kate um, actually host uh, a vigil. I think 200 or 300 people come out every night for Black Lives Matter, even though they're not even black, right? Um, so we've seen a lot of that happening, um, not only just here in the city, but um, nationally and internationally. I mean, Hong Kong had a Black Lives Matter rally, right? I mean, Singapore, all these different places, France. Um, so just speak a little bit more of that. How are you seeing this movement shape up? Um, and, and where do we go from here? And I wanna start to shift the conversation a little bit into that space. Oh, now we have all these protests and marches. Where do we go from here? So Martha, I wanna start with you. So I just wanna give a shout out to all the young folks that are stepping up and um, taking over the movement. It is not meant for like myself and, and some of the elders to like repeat the action and repeat the work. Wait a minute, you're an elder, Martha? I feel like it because okay. like, I right. feel like okay. I was out there for Trayvon Martin and I'm tired. <laughs> like I'm tired of walking. I'm tired of kneeling. I'm tired of saying the names and I I'm welcoming the youth. Um, I wish there was a way for us to communicate better to train them and teach them the ways of organizing and doing it from a grassroots level. Um, and I've had the pleasure yesterday of organizing super grassroots with like people that grew up that I grew up with in Left Rack City. And it was like the first Black Lives Matter kind of event in Left Rack City, which was historic. Um, but the one that I led that, you know, you, Don, um, Councilman and um, Adrian attended was, you know, a teach-in uh, because I'm tired of marching. Um, and I knew that having it in Forest Hills, it was an, a teachable moment to attract the white and Jewish population to listen to black and brown voices talking about what it is to be black and talk about economic independence and you know the legislation and how it's all of this has impacted us. I you know I've been talking a lot about turning our pain into purpose and I think the next part of the movement is having those conversations in many different spaces with many different people. Um, and as a Latina having that conversation as a first generation that like everything that I was taught, which is like, you know, that like to follow the rules, don't, you know, talk back to police, be respectful, go to college, you know, all the things that my parents taught me to keep me safe, you know, because as immigrants, we, you know, have to worry about our immigration status and we don't always have the privilege of being able to, you know, push back on the establishment. And as an American citizen, I, I have that privilege. Um, but there's, Obviously, you know, the next part of the movement is like bringing up these young kids, but also having uncom very uncomfortable conversations. I think a lot of us are past the marching and a lot of us are past the chanting and having these conversations about like, you know, why haven't we had a black NYPD commissioner? Why don't we have more diversity and so much, so many agencies of like, how are we in the most diverse city and every agency and every C-suite is still white. Like there's so much systematic racism that we have to talk about and deal with in so many levels. And it's just like, it's like a reckoning. You know, I, I've been calling 2020 the reckoning because there's just been so many things that like we're addressing all at once. Um, outside of just like getting out to vote and filling out your census, it's just like, how do you wanna reimagine society? You know, COVID has made us reimagine our society, how we work, how we parent and how we're now dealing with policing. You know, what does safety mean to you? Would you rather have a peace officer versus a police officer? You know, would you rather them de-escalate versus arresting you? You know, how do we want to be treated as a society and, and moving forward and reinvesting the money that would go to policing into our schools or into homelessness or mental health? I mean, not only mental health for ourselves, but for the officers, you know, re-examining how we even have the mental uh, evaluation for officers. Like when's the last time we've even checked that? Like, let's talk to some black therapists and see like how we should be reevaluating them. You know, like there's so many different things that we can be doing. And I think that, you know, I appreciate all the protests because obviously that's how we've been able to get legislation passed, but you know, we have to move way past election day. This has to be something permanent that all of us, not only just, you know, moving into 2021 with like very many opportunities to change our city government, but also just like how we redo census and, and our lines and our representation. And, you know, I think that the, the call to action is 
bringing more of these young people into the electoral work, getting them to be in the party leadership um, and getting them to run for party positions and understanding that process on the DNC level, but also running for office themselves and getting more involved and getting them on the community board and into precinct council meetings and understanding what this all is, this community that we talk about. You know, what is this thing that these elders are obsessed with that they go religiously, but we could care less because like love and hip hop is on. So like, we have to figure that out. Like, what is that thing? Because you can't like be on the gram hashtagging it and holding up a sign like you like that's cute, but like, what else are you doing? So we have to all pull ourselves together and pull them with us and move this forward because if not, it is gonna turn into another hashtag. I'm gonna go to Tiffany now to respond to that as well. So where do we go from here? I think everyone who has been a part of the movement or is just joining our movement to find their voice and find their level of participation in the movement. And by now, there is no excuse why everyone should not be involved in this movement. I don't care if you're black, brown, yellow, or orange. Find your level of participation in this movement and use your voice to join the conversation to get justice. Um, for racial and social in inclusion um, and normalizing racial equity. Like that's what we're asking for. And I remember I watched a video of a young lady who um, said, and, and I, by no means am I inciting violence, but she said, the NYPD is lucky that we're not seeking revenge. We're not seeking revenge. We're just seeking justice for all of the wrongdoings that has taken place over the course of our history. And so uh, I say everyone, I encourage and urge everyone to join the conversation in normalizing racial equity um, from the factors that drove segregation in our history, from the fact in the past and present day concentrated poverty and the disparities that we constantly have to have conversations about. and we constantly have to fight against. And I think it's unfortunate that to this very day, we're still fighting for basic rights, like to have to be included in the conversation, to be included in the initial plans. Like Southeast Queens is constantly, or Queens, I'll leave it at Southeast Queens, is constantly left out of the initial plans where we have to go back like, uh, CM, I'll use you as an example, and Councilmember Adams and Lander and Miller and these the elected officials in Queens and in Rockaways, where we're constantly fighting for equality and equity in our education system, in how we're being handled in our communities, where that takes away from another type of conversation where we can be talking about something else. We can be negotiating the investments that we wanna put into our schools and our education system. And we're tired, like we're tired of the looters and the people who are distracting, trying to distract um, our, our movement, trying to distract people from our movement and the people who are trying to tell our stories. Like we're tired of people who lack human decency and tired of racism within the areas of law enforcement and the criminal legal system. Like we're in 2020 and it sounds like we're still having a conversation from 1920. And I just wanna say, I just wanna end on this, that for those, uh, for those who are, trying to figure out how you can join our movement, who's trying to become an ally, uh, who doesn't know how to be uh, an asset in the Black experience, and you've heard about or you've witnessed over the past few weeks or over the course of your lifetime, uh, just joining the movement, it is my hope, it is my very hope that you use this as an opportunity and CM, you always um, highlight using this 
as an opportunity to excel and advance. And it is my hope that people use this as an opportunity um, to reflect on their own responsibilities for addressing racism and the deprivation of our basic human rights to the point that even in a global pandemic, we're still having this conversation and we're still protesting and we're still um, having to, what do you say, agitate, um, educate and legislate. Why are we doing this in the middle of a pandemic? And so I just, I just urge everyone to use any platform that you have to raise your voice and to spread our message, the correct message and not allowing the media or anyone else to tell our story or to change our narrative. And I wanna move now to um, the youngest people on the Zoom call, Adrian Adams and Brad Lander. Um, <laughs> does this feel different? Um, and, you know, Adjoa has a good question for us. Um, you know, what are some substantial things and policies or what are some things we can do moving you know, from the protests, you know, I mean, the protests are going to continue to happen. There was one today, there was one yesterday, and it seems like they're, you know, we're going to, people are going to continue to march, but outside of marching, what are some policies, what are some things we should be looking at areas of focus? And I sort of want to start to move into this space as we get closer to eight o'clock now um, on what are some, um, some concrete steps we can take and you can give one or two examples of things we can do right now in this moment um, in history to, to, not, to ensure we're not repeating these same things again. Um, and I think there have been some, you know, some solid steps taken. I mean, I don't think people recognize how big 50A repeal was. I don't think people recognize um, how the conversation just around the police budget, this is not something new we talk about when we talk about um, how much overtime the NYPD spends a year, 780 million last year. Um, in, in overtime costs, but this year it seems to be a lot more momentum to finally tighten in the belt um, straps uh, around the NYPD. So there, there are some things that certainly feel different. Um, but you know, you you guys have been around a lot less than us, young people on this call. When we're interested in hearing, does this feel different, and what are some concrete things we should be looking at or areas right now? You know, leaving this call. So I'll start with um, Adrian first, and then we'll go to. Um, Councilmember Lander. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Councilmember Richards. It's so important that uh, we don't miss this moment in time. Um, it feels like deja vu, but it really doesn't feel like deja vu. This is different. This is this is totally different. When I when I hear from my elders who've been around in the 50s and 60s, uh, even they say something very different about this. And you know. Someone said it best, and, I, and I'll, I'll digress a little bit and I'll come back to the point. When George Floyd called his mother as he was dying, he summoned the ancestors. That to me is the difference. And I think that call, that clarion call, when he called his dead mother as he was dying, that opened up a whole other realm. Um, and, you know, I take it there, Donovan, I take it to that whole spiritual thing all the time because I, I, that's what I believe. I believe that George Floyd took it to the ancestors who then opened something up that had never been opened and exposed like this before as far as we as a people are concerned. And we are experiencing that rain now, that rain of the ancestors down onto this planet, not on New York, not on Minneapolis, not on Hong Kong, on Italy, on France, but an entire planet was affected by the call to the ancestors to do something for this people of color. So we can start there. As far as where we go from here, our colleague who's on now, council member I, Danique Miller, he always says it best and I learn a lot from him. And we learn a lot from each other, all of us, the three, the three of us, um, you know, the, the triple threat in Southeast Queens. I learn a lot from, from Danique, he's very wise. And he's always talking about infrastructure. Now is the time that we take a look at collectively the infrastructure of, of course, we're very protective of Southeast Queens. That's us. That's where we were born and raised, live our lives. We take a look at the infrastructure. What now can we do legislatively to protect the infrastructure? For me, I'm always going to hearken back to the children 
uh, to the education pieces. For Donovan, he's going to hearken back, and I'm now partnering with that too, to the political aspect, I'm sorry, for the, um, the, the policing, the public safety aspect of the whole picture. For Danique, he is going to be, he's going to take a look at collectively what our labor force takes a look at and how that has a part um, in this collective infrastructure. So for me and marrying all these pieces and so many more legislatively, we make sure that our children have access to those guidance counselors, to social services. We put together some policies that make sure that there is no doubt and no need to continue to beg for funding that we should never have to beg for from an administration that continues to want to cut those things. You know, from the, they're cutting our heartstrings when they cut those things. So we take a look at trying to build the infrastructure around protecting our children. We take a look at policy and infrastructure around the things that took our hospitals away, as Danique and I were talking about the other day. We have no hospital, all right? So we have no place to care for our dying of COVID. We have no place to care for our wounded. We have no place to care for in our districts, some place that is going to remedy heal and save our lives. There is no hospital. They've been closed. They've been shut down. So we take a look at those things and then we pull in that public safety that marries into all of this infrastructure and we make sure that those that wear the label of protect and serve really do that. And I go back to what one of the sisters said, um, uh, speaking about, who was it? I think it was Tiffany, I think who spoke about um, going back and taking a look at this model again. You know, when things don't work out right, you go back to the drawing board, you take another test, you apply again. If you can't get this right, you're out of here. So we have several ways to take a look at policy, at legislation, and at infrastructure to, to, to put forth a new train on the track. Let's go to Danique and then Brad on this. And I just want to hear, you know, policy. And I think Adrian hit it. You got to marry all these things. There's no one um, right way. There's no one wrong way, right? I mean, you have to marry all of these things um, collectively to really shift um, policy and shift the system that we're dealing with. I mean, there are people who think we're going to demolish the NYPD system overnight. Um, you know, this is ingrained um, in our city and in our country. You know, policing seems to be the answer for everything. Um, so how do we, you know, make those substantial changes? Uh, and I want to go to Danique Miller now to talk about some solutions. And um, one other thing I want to acknowledge is both Danique Miller and Adrian Adams are the co-chairs of the Black and Latino Asian Caucus, which is the largest caucus in the city council. So, um, so uh, collectively, the BLAC has been leading and using uh, uh, the collective power to also shift policy um, that we're going to see move this week as well. Um, at the city council. So uh, I'll go to I, Danique Miller. Welcome abroad, brother. Unmute yourself. See, I knew it. We do these calls so much, you forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot <laughs> going on. I didn't, I didn't want all that to jump in. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I, hey, is that council member Belanda over there? So good to see you, Brad. So a, a, as a matter of policy and, and where we are here, it's important that we look at this thing uh, in, in, in a full holistic way. And, and as you talk about, um, you know, it was glad to hear Adrian talk about infrastructure. Obviously she knows that's one of our pet peeves, one of the pet peeves that really contribute to the disparities that we've seen, particularly as it related to uh, COVID-19 and so forth, right? The fact that we were lacking healthcare infrastructure, the fact that our, our children couldn't immediately transition to remote learning, uh, 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 infrastructure like transportation and, and the equities, the inequities that, that lie there, all the things that impact us on a regular basis. And it's interesting, if you look at the, 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 the caucuses um, uh, response to the executive budget, that preceded uh, what we see now in this movement that has uh, reinvigorated itself uh, since the unfortunate death of, of, of our brother George Floyd, um, that we had begun to address these inequities in the budget even prior to this movement, right? And so this has to uh, has to transcend that. And we also, I also, uh, as I jumped on, I heard 
uh, you're talking about the narrative as well, right? And so we must continue to control the narrative so to ensure that the narrative reflects our voice and the needs and values of our community. It's great that we have all these allies that, that, that have jumped on. It's absolutely necessary, but the, but, but the narrative and the lead has to come from those who have, have lived this experience, right? And, and so it is very easy to, un, to, to, to kind of gravitate towards that, that message, that soundbite, but there are many things that are going to impact that, uh, uh, impact our community in, in an equally or more profound way. And that is talking about all of the, all of, uh, all of the, the budget in a way that we ensure that these services are being delivered, that, that agencies and, and infrastructure that support all these inequities are in place, right? And so um, we can't, uh, it'd be remiss if, 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 if we'd be remiss, not just remiss, we'd be irresponsible if we didn't address all those things. And and, and also um, from a policy perspective, and I, I'm sure that you laid out and articulated uh, what has, you know, what the work that has been done over the past six years, particularly over the last two and a half years at, under your leadership, of the uh, 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 as, as the chair of, of public safety, and uh, you know, I, just before as I was on the phone with a with a reporter, and and we were having this exact conversation, and and what did that mean around policy that impacted us, and and, and really it was the things uh, the, the the innate um, uh, disproportions that we just deal with and what we have done uh, to address. And, and how we have kind of leveraged this moment to ensure that policy and legislation that impacts our community is really coming to the forefront. And, and, and the simple thing is, is you know, we talked about, we, we passed the EMS resolution of equal pay last, uh, last stated meeting, right? And, and EMS is at the forefront, the absolute forefront of COVID-19 because the fire department, which is the police department 4.0, right, had an absolute mandate that they didn't answer respiratory calls and they didn't answer COVID-19 calls, right? And so while these predominantly black and brown, predominantly women um, workforce uh, who earn a third less than their, uh, uh, more less than a third uh, of their white counterparts in the fire department, or not being compensated and being, and so all these things that happen that impact the infrastructure and also um, who we are as a community uh, around around housing and all those other things, which is um, what we're able to address. We're using this moment, but at, for for the purpose of this conversation here, you know, it's interesting as as a kind of a diversion. I'm, I, I I I spent about fifteen minutes listening to sports radio today, and. And uh, one of the, one of the, the commentators, uh, uh, Chris Canty, uh, former New York Giant, was talking to his colleague on the radio, and he was like, oh, "If we don't have this uncomfortable conversation, then it's not getting fixed, right?" And some of the callers be like, "Ah, can we just play baseball? Can we just play sports?" We need to have this uncomfortable conversation because this New York City that we live in that allows you to, which remains probably one of the most segregated big cities, if not the most in the country, right? If, you, if, if we're not neighbors and not having that conversation and we don't go to school together, maybe we work together, but the things that, that allow us to, to interact the most don't happen in our community. So it is very easy for us to create this cocoon that I live in this world and that whatever happens outside that world doesn't matter to me, right? That I could be, if, you know, uh, if, if COVID struck a Brad community or a community of non-color um, and it only impacted that community, why should I care if it's not coming to me, right? And if it is like, even the disparities that we see and the inequities that we see in the schools, if my children have the technology and access to technology and, and the higher education, why do I care, right? And so, because we're not co-mingling in that way, um, the only thing that we can do is force these uncomfortable conversations. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you put out the call to have this. Um, and I think it's gonna take us a long way, but, but 
I think it's going to allow us to digress and see some of the uh, some of the some of the contributions that have been made by virtue of uncomfortable times. Um, and more importantly, to to to, and, and I leave this with addressing young folks. This is not going to happen on social media, right? Th these conversations, you got to talk to people. You you can't you you can't you you're going to have to talk. Yeah, you can organize, right? But ultimately, the goal has to be to engage. And it's going to be discourse, and you're going to have to figure out a way to reach those common interests, right? And figure out why I should care about someone other than myself. Right, even in your own community, right? Because we haven't gotten to that point either, right? Um, that you care about your neighbor as you treat your neighbor and care about your neighbor as you do yourself. And so when we get to that point, we're gonna be okay. But this moment is about getting us to the point, right? And as we say in the activist world, uh, a, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And we will not waste this crisis. We will continue to uh, engage and leverage um, this for, for as, as, as much as we can. And so I'm excited about that one. Thank the, the council member for his leadership and, and, and I early voted and you're gonna be so excited when I see this, when you see this, this video um, that, that I'm, I'm so excited about and, and we need to, because that's the change. That's the change that our ancestors fought for, right? That is the absolute change. And it's so important that people to this day, they're number one on their agenda um, is is voter suppressing. It's to figure out ways to keep us from the polls. So let's not keep ourselves from the polls. Let's do what and 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 so that that's a change, right? Because unfortunately, when you can't change the culture, sometimes you have to have responsible, like-minded, intelligent legislators that will legislate when you can't educate, right? And so I, I'll leave you guys with that. Thank you, brother. Thank you. We're going to go to Brad now. What are you thinking about? It's a real honor to follow uh, Councilmember Miller. Janique, it's good to see you and uh, and be on this call with both of the co-chairs of the VLAC and the, the Southeast Queens triple threat. So I feel very honored here. Um, and I, I think what both Adrian and Janique said is just really important because we have to find a way both to make some real meaningful concrete policy change. And there's a lot of things we could do next. Donovan, you mentioned the commissioner's sole authority over police discipline. Like, why is that not getting questioned? Like, let's talk to our, that's gotta be changed in Albany. Let's talk to our state allies and say, hey, you know what? This is one piece of the problem or all those areas we talked about. Let's look at mental health response. Let's look at, you know, d uh, domestic violence response. Let's look at cure violence expansion. So we have to make concrete uh, progress, but I think what both Adrian and Danique said about the need to like, we're not going to get there by grabbing, you know, one thing at a time. Like this is a moment to step back and see. Um, and I, maybe I'll start here. Uh, Adrian mentioned, um, you know, the the kind of dying words of George Floyd. One one set of words that I I saw this amazing Trevor Noah clip, thinking back on what uh, Amy, Amy Cooper showed white people. And you know what what was so striking to me there is like. We always talk about this as though it's like an incident, you know, like some some person got killed and, you know, you know, yes, it's terrible, but it's kind of just an isolated incident. And what Amy Cooper showed by showing that she knew that at any moment she could call down state violence on Christian Cooper is to say, I am aware as a white person that I walk around in a world where like white supremacy uh, and the possibility of, of state violence on, on black people exists all the time, like not just when a random incident is taking place. And it feels to me like if you know that, you also know, you know what? When I walk around in the housing market, I know that's true as well. I can approach a bank or a seller differently. And you know it in the education space as well. And, you know, so it's like, how do we you know, that really is the sort of moment of looking at, you know, whether, I don't know, people, some people call it like truth and reconciliation, or some people call it a reparations process. It's like, can we take this moment and actually help people see how just disastrously far from the ideals of something like equality we are in our infrastructure, in our schools, in our housing, in our 
uh, workforce and, and economy, because we're not going to be able to fix all that with like one or two quick bills we could come up with in the city council, you know, in the next two weeks. And if we're going to use this moment to commit ourselves to a thorough set of policy steps that seek to undo white supremacy and build a more genuinely equal democracy, like that's a long process. Um, but it can't be either like we got one policy tool right now or that's just so pie in the sky. Like what kind of bridge? That's why I like the idea of a truth and reconciliation process or, or something that helps us really go through sector by sector in the way that the council members were talking about and commit ourselves to that more ambitious agenda, which we'll only do if we can keep the kind of like emotional cracked openness of this moment, but then build it in for the longer term. So I look forward to trying to continue to follow because with, with leadership like you guys, I think people will be able to hear it. Um, and we just have to keep trying to, to show up for that step by step by step. Hey, awesome. I want to go into, um, and we're going to begin to sort of wrap up um, soon, but I want to go into what, you know, it, it, is the relationship between PD and our community irreparable? Um, is there, is, is this it? Um, I mean, you know, we saw what happened at the protest. Um, obviously, uh, there's been a lot of goodwill put forward, um, you know, by the police department, speaking in all honesty, I mean, our local precincts right here in Queens, I mean, we work very well with them, not to say that they're not systematic issues that, that obviously we still have to deal with. Um, but, but for the most part, we didn't really experience the the same amount of rage or level of rage, I want to say, um, here that we saw in Brooklyn, um, perhaps and in Manhattan. Um, so the question I have for, um, you know, I'll, I'll start with, I'll try to start with someone I didn't start with, but I'll, I guess I'll start with Tiffany and then we'll work to Martha and Andrea and Kerleen, um, and then work our way up um, to everybody else. You know, could we repair the relationship after everything we've seen? Or is it different here than what it was in Brooklyn? Or we are, we are police relations better in Queens? Why didn't we see some of the rage that we saw in other parts of, of the city? Um, so I'll start with you, um, uh, Andrea, and then we'll work our way down. Oh, I said Tiffany, Tiffany, Andrea, and then Martha. I, I believe that, I believe in continuing to fight until we just can't fight anymore. And though I feel like we are at that point, um, we should continue to uh, fight this battle through the legislation that you, you council members have um, put in play to uh, regulate and uh, reform the police department. And it's interesting because I had this conversation with a friend yesterday who asked me the same question, and he believes that the only solution to the problem that we're having now is to resolve back to uh, the actions that the Black Panther Party uh, pursued in arming um, ourselves back then, so that the police, uh, so that police officers won't bother us. And while again, I don't promote. Uh, violence, um, I do think that it will take some unorthodox um, behavior or actions to really shake the system because we're being civilized. Like we're, we're marching. We can't march in peace. We, they won't even let us be sick in peace. Like we weren't even able to be home and heal ourselves because our brothers and sisters are being killed in the streets over something that is supposed to be de-escalated. And so I I don't I don't think we should give up. Um, even though the NYPD disciplinary system is broken and a lot of our systems are um, corrupt and 
it, it just seems like it, it cannot be repaired. Um, I, I do think that we should continue to fight um, until we see that change, until we see, until we get the justice that we deserve and until <clears throat> our communities are no longer um, uh, facing the disparities and the discrimination that we've been facing for so long. And so with that, I'll, I'll finish with saying, um, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he didn't give up. Malcolm X didn't give up. Asada Shakur didn't give up. Afini Shakur, Huey P. Newton, um, Bobby Seale, they, they didn't give up. And so I don't think we should give up uh, in this fight to pursue justice and equality and equity. Awesome, all right, I'm gonna go to Andrea. Um, uh, uh, to echo what, what Tiffany just said, I think over decades, um, centuries, there's been a lot of harm and violence and, and pain inflicted um, on our communities. I think uh, the NYPD, this administration, past administrations have been very complicit in that and enabled um, that behavior and, and that violence. And so uh, right now, I think it's really hard to think about repairing that. Um, and I think the, the train of thought should be around thinking about restructuring and, and re rethinking what safety is and not thinking that safety is just simply in the hands of the NYPD, but more so in our communities, in, in our education system, in our healthcare system, in mental health support. Um, but again, that takes uh, political courage from the mayor, city council to, to make those cuts um, that we're asking for. And I know the city council um, did put in that, uh, they put that in the budget. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. But I think there has been a lot of pain and violence inflicted that needs to, that the city just did not address with Eric Garner, Sean Bell, Ramarley Graham, Akai Gurley, like th there's such a long list. Um, and so it, it's, it is hard to think about re repairing that. Mokta, I like, I like the honest dialogue here too. Um, I, somebody told me something profound the other day, which is like, we still talk about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and all of these people that have literally died 50 years ago. We have a strong need for some new generation to come up and start leading our people. So that's one thing that I want to acknowledge. Um, I, I think that like with policing and, and like I said before, like we really have to reimagine what we want our society to look like. I really think that we have to take a step back as councilman uh, Adam said, and just figure out like, what do we want to do first? And how do we want to do things and bring more local, you know, residents in. But I also want to acknowledge there's a huge generational divide. And there has to be a generational conversation. Um, when Trayvon Martin happened, there was a lot of older folks who, you know, were telling us not to march and telling us not to, you know, cause trouble or like, you know, and because they were, you know, taught to be complacent and or follow the rules and all of these things that we have been taught and not really like, you know, push as hard as we could outside of voting. Um, and I think that is really where we should start is this intergenerational conversation of like, what does safety mean for me under 40 versus for you over 40? Um, and acknowledge their PTSD of what happened in the 80s and 90s during the crack era that was real too. Um, but also acknowledge our generation of stop and frisk and also being scared to go to school because we had school shootings, which I graduated, you know, way before any of that happened. So I, my heart goes out to these students that have to actually go through gun drills, which is something I would never imagine in school outside of like, you know, I grew up with school safety agents that like asked me to go get them a bagel from the bagel shop. Like they were our friends, like they deescalated us we had guidance counselors, we had, we didn't have police in our schools, you know, and it was a community environment and we need to get back to that. It's having more um, step programs and just other things that were just wraparounds, just whatever the kid needed to address it as opposed to using police and force and suspensions 
and other things to create this, you know, um, record in a sense for that student and then bringing them into the CUNY system and then further out into the workforce. Um, but I really would stress that we need to start talking to our elders and really having them understand what we're going through. I don't think that they understand the trauma of stop, question, and frisk and what that's done to our generation. Thank you. I'm going to go to Alain and Curleen. We were missing you for a little while, Alain. No, I'm, I'm here. Um, <laughs> so the question, so the question was, how can we repair, you know, could we repair relations between the police department and our communities during this moment of time? I think that in the long run, it's possible. But for me, honestly, and, I, and this is my personal opinion, the NYPD has to lead by example. Um, I, I can't honestly say that um, a, a positive relationship or it, can the relationship be repaired when I know that black police officers are being mistreated and people of color who are police officers are being mistreated within the departments. Um, for me, uh, personally, I think that a lot of work needs to happen in the community first. Um, I'm, I'm all about accountability and I think that there needs to be internal alignment in our community about the needs and what we and how to move Southeast Queens forward. And, and that's the reason why I joined the NAACP um, with a lot of young professionals with Candace and everybody because literally I've, I've heard so many different variations of, oh, this is what our community should do. But when it comes down to doing the work and executing it, monitoring, progress monitoring and putting the thing, putting the work behind it, nobody shows up. And everybody that knows me and I've said this, and, and I don't have a problem saying this right now in this webinar. Don't invite me to a rally. Don't invite me to any protests unless you're willing to really put in the ground work that's required. You know, I almost feel like, and this is my personal opinion, that in our community, specifically in Southeast Queens, and I've said this on in other variations, that I almost feel like social justice is, is like an audition for the oppression Olympics. It's like we're in competition with each other. You know, we're using um, this whole climate to push certain agendas. And for me, I think it's a disgrace. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be straight up honest. You know, our seniors and people literally, I was just looking at a, a documentary from Rosedale where they were burning crosses and doing all types of stuff. You know, and, and for me, it's like, so we have all this energy to put together these marches and these little protests and stuff. But when it comes down to really getting people together and collaborating in an effective way to create a vision for our community that we all can benefit from, I don't see that happening. And for me, to be honest, and I hold myself accountable because I've been watching, trying, waiting for somebody to do it. And in reality, I'm the person that needs to do it. So that's exactly what um, I'm gonna do. You know, that's it. Well said, we're gonna go to Caroline. Yeah, so before I even talk about the NYPD, the one thing I want young people, everybody actually listening to, to remember and not forget while we're out there protesting saying Black Lives Matter, the bottom line is your life has always mattered. Your life, you were always precious. You were born that way. You are a gift from God and no one can take that away from you. No one can change it and no one can terrorize it out of you. It's innate. Um, in terms of working with working with the police, what do we do? Um, I definitely think the legislation, um, because while we can't get to the hearts and minds of every police officer, if we have pinpointed legislation that can set forth the ways in which we can keep them accountable and see that they are punished for particularly their infractions, that they don't just lose a vacation day. Like there's an actual real sanction that can be measured and we can make sure that everybody commit that offense, just like in court, you commit that offense, this is what you're gonna get and you're gonna be held accountable. And if you do it, but so many times you will not have a job. That is one way. Reimagining the, the role of the police is a call for the community for us to step up and take responsibility in our own communities for what happens in our communities. And when Johnny so-and-so does something, we can have a conversation and we can work with Johnny. And I think one thing that doesn't necessarily relate to the police, but we could take 
that some of their money and use it. Summer youth should never ever be on the chopping block. It should never be a conversation. If you cannot give young people something meaningful to do, what do you expect is gonna happen? That makes no sense. We've got to always make sure that young people have opportunities, that they have summer youth, that they have the opportunity to do internships, positive things that will get steer them in the right direction. That is a good use of NYPD money. Because you know what? If we do that, we will need less NYPD enforcement if we take care of our children. Well said. Um, I think I got to all of you and I now want to go because I think um, and we're going to begin to close out, but I want to go to Adrian and Danique on this because I think um, um, Curleen made some valid valid points right that elected officials clearly have the key to resolving each and every one of these issues ourselves. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? How do people get engaged if they're not engaged um, in this movement and what should what are some things people can consider doing? You know, if you can't, I think I remember an old quote, if you can't march, then, then write. Or, you know, it, but people should find their own avenues of advocacy, but it seems to also always be this heavy reliance on the electeds have to fix all of these issues and we have the answers. Um, and, it, and it is true. I mean, we have a responsibility to look at things legislatively, budgetarily, and that's all a fight. Um, and obviously we've seen some progress, partly because we were fueled, um, our gas tanks were filled in um, this week because of a lot of the momentum we got from the public on a lot of the issues that might have technically been held up for a long time, right? Um, so how do, how, how do you speak to the public now? What do we say to those who want to get engaged and those who believe that, you know, we're the only answer to resolving all of these issues? And I'll start with uh, Adrian first. Yeah, thanks, Donovan. Uh, you know, it, it, it's so relevant, you know, what was just said. I think it's just really important that we inform everyone that is on this call that, um, yes, we are elected officials, and yes, we are your next door neighbors. Legislation comes from you. I get my ideas for legislation from my constituents, from you from the people of the city of New York. It's not something that we just pull out of thin air. I've encouraged since day one uh, of, of my time being elected um, for the, the two plus years now, um, and even have included in several, I think my, new, my first year of doing a newsletter, what are your ideas for legislation? Let me know. Legislation comes through your eyes. So governing comes through your eyes. You are the government. So for everybody that says, oh, what are the elected officials doing? What are the elected officials doing? You put us in, in place to be your voices. Now, if you choose not to have a voice, I, my voice is your voice. So you, may, you put us there to get the work done. But if you're sitting back, you know, just saying, well, what are they doing? I've got an issues, but we don't know your specific issues. Then Houston, we've got a problem. There's a disconnect there. So we are, we, we are the ones that are, you know, we answer to you. This, you put us to work here to do your work. But if we don't hear your voice to tell us what your work specifically is, I know what my work is. Because before I was elected, I was a constituent. And I didn't like what was, you know, what I saw around me as a constituent of District 28. You know, we were, we were left behind in a lot of things. And um, it's neither here nor there now. But we needed a change, and, I, and I'm hoping to keep continuing to, to do that uplifting to make that change happen. But those changes happen through the voices of constituents, through your voices. So again, we take our marching orders from you. Yes, we are the legislators, but the legislative voice comes from you. Go on to Big D, Denise. Unmute. Unmute yourself, Denise. <laughs> Danique, does he hear us? Oh, unmute yourself, Danique. <laughs> oh, I think he's on his own. Oh, there you go. All right. See, I know him. <laughs> hey, sir. So, 
Yeah, so the question was, Danique, um, um, you know, people rely heavily on electeds and, um, you know, and we do have a, a big responsibility, obviously, to carrying out legislation and, and budget. But what are some things people in the public could be focused on as well? Well, that, that is, you know, that's, you know, we always talk about where we are, how we got here, uh, and, and, and really the public discourse, the public discourse that we've had, a lot that we've done, um, and uh, policy-wise has been by virtue of the conversations that we've had with, with, with you know the, the marijuana disparities that we've seen very specifically in Southeast Queens. If we weren't hearing that those those type of uh, inequities and, and that voice coming from our young folks, um, that would not be public policy now, right? Um, damn, damn, like and, and then the need for um, whether it's housing, hospitals, and the rest of that stuff. Um, so it's the discourse part that that you have to engage us. But even once we've identified these disparities, we know that our mission is now going to be addressing those things. Like, like we cannot absolutely um, uh, uh, be in the midst of this COVID crisis and not prepare ourselves for what's next, right? And, and so, which was the reason why we, we fought so hard for testing and then knowing coming out of it, um, how do we address these disparities and, and these inequities in infrastructure? And so um, support us on uh, 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 particularly healthcare, right? We've had in district, we saw three Walgreens within one square mile um, close down, right? And, 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 you know, very little that we can do um, in terms of policy other than watch zoning and, and what goes in there. Um, but I would suggest that how we invest and reinvest in our own communities is, is, is super important that, that we have that dialogue, right? That when we're owning land, we decide what goes on that land and, and controlling the things that we can, tr can control. But also really standing behind what we have identified as priorities for our community moving up moving forward, right? And so we have, you know, um, those that that are our constant fight in education and housing and other equities around, as Brad mentioned, banking and things like you, we spend so much money and we can't go into a traditional bank and get a mortgage, even though we have money in there. So on that sense, I would suggest that we, we be very mindful of how we spend our dollars, right? And that's what we all can do. We can control our dollars in that sense by supporting people that support us, right? We could also reinvest in our own community and then, but support these priorities that we all have collectively come up with. How do we do that? How do we not just support um, the housing and, and the healthcare and the education and so forth, but those real priorities that and inequities that, that leave us um, in, in, in a real negative deficit every time we enter a crisis, how do we address those? And, and so whatever we consider to be our budget priorities, and, and that is um, investment in communities that were hardest hit in COVID-19, making sure that the community knows what those priorities are in the same way that we've got the literally millions of emails from folks who are asking us to de defund the NYPD. When we have a narrative that is very specific to our community and those needs in our community, we need you to be just as vigilant in doing that, right? And those are the things that we can do. Just be supportive, come up with your own idea. Listen, it's 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 26 of us at the Black Latino Asian Caucus, it's 51 of us in, in, uh, in the body. And every once in a while we get a good idea but there are 200,000 good ideas in each district, right? Make sure that there was good ideas. Don't, don't keep it to yourself, right? Talk to the right person and, and, and we'll make it happen, you know, but also be supportive in, in what's absolutely necessary. And, and we have, you know, we can't be, we can't afford the luxury of focusing on a singular issue, right? Um, Cause things happen too rapidly and then we're still, being super impacted by COVID, right? But at the same time, we don't want to broaden too much, right? So we, we got five or six issues um, that we need to keep on the front burner. Um, 
and, and those are the things that we can do. And I ask everyone to do that. But most importantly, at this moment in time, it's two things that we can all do. Census and voting. Right. And, and let's make sure that everybody is using their entire network to make sure that those things happen, because this is about money, power and respect. And without those two, we don't have either. Thank you. So we're going to begin to wrap up and I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, and, you know, certainly there are a lot of different things people can get engaged in. How do you take this energy? Um, you know, first of all, legislatively, as Danique and Adrian alluded to, you know, that's our priority, you know, um, you know, and I think we're, we're certainly moving some, some great bills and it's it, it actually the, to tell the truth, it's not even because of what we saw with George Floyd. I mean, a lot of this stuff was in motion, um, but really what catapulted it all of a sudden was the momentum around shifting policing and the narrative around the country. Which, is, which has had everybody, all of a sudden, the governor and the mayor throwing in their focus to policing, right? That's all because of the work that you've done. So, so that, um, obviously, the budget fights ahead are, are, you know, we're in a $9 billion budget deficit in New York City. And, you know, we always, um, you know, there's an old analogy, when America gets a cold, uh, we get pneumonia. So we have to make sure that even as we go through a budget cut, um, in the city and we make tough decisions that our communities aren't the one where you're taking the hatchet to first. So that's something to really adhere to and watch and rally around. Today, there was a, a rally around summer youth employment program that was uh, run by a young lady uh, out of Southeast Queens who just saw the program was cut and decided Nadine, who decided to get up and do something about it. And I popped in there. Um, but that is our fight right now, the three of us here um, collectively in a Black Latino Asian caucus, how do we get summer youth employment program restored? And I can tell you now, I won't be voting for a budget that doesn't have money included in it. And I know my colleagues sharing that, and we all have expressed that collectively. And that's why the mayor has sort of backpedaled on his original statements that there will be no program now, right? You see him sort of throwing it out there in a piecemeal fashion now, but there has to be money in the budget for that. Um, some other things folks can do, you can join your community board and join your civic association, um, tenant association. You know, there's a lot of different organizations. There are meetings every night in Southeast Queens. I mean, it's been tough during COVID, but a lot of our elders who have been running this ship for a long time have converted to Zoom calls now. <laughs> so get involved. I mean, don't just pro protesting is good and we need you to do that. We need people to march. Everybody has a role to play. But when the marching stops, what are you engaging yourself in? What organization have you joined? And we don't need everybody going out there creating new organizations either. You know, when these things happen, you get 100 people want to create a new organization. There are organizations that are doing some good work, whether you like them or not. If you need to have that tough conversation around how to make things better, the key to doing that is to make sure you support them, that you join them and not just come in murder mouthing the first day. I don't like what you're doing. Get involved and change things from, um, from within. Uh, Danique talked about the census um, as well in voting. You know, protest to the polls. June 23rd is here. No one should have an excuse. If you were in the voter uh, rolls, you got an absentee application. I'm not telling you who to vote for in this call, but the point is, I just want to make, is that there's really no excuse. You are home. It should never be an excuse, whether you work or not, to get to the polls but you have early voting happening now. How many of you have gone out and actually early voted and made your voice heard through the political process, right? I mean, you really have no excuse. Don't come to us complaining about your pothole and why these things are not fixed because guess what? The bean counters down at City Hall, wanna, they're gonna respond to the communities that are most active. They're gonna respond to the communities where the mayor knows he has to go to get some votes, right? That's just the name of the game. It's a numbers game. So if we're lethargic and, and um, narcoleptic um, <laughs> in these situations, it's hard to bring change. And then you wanna come to us and say to us, why don't we have a hospital? You know, you gotta be engaged. It gives us political strength to be able to do these things. So I just wanted to close out on that, but there are a lot of good things happening. And that's why marching is important but we're gonna eventually the protests are gonna wane out, wean out. Um, the clubs are gonna open up. 
the restaurants are going to open up and will we just go back to life? Will it just be back to, to, to doing what we did before all of this? Or will we remain part of the mission and completing the mission as we redesign police departments um, and restructure them in the city and state and around the country? Um, so that would be my advice there. And I'm going to close out now. I want to hear some parting words from organizations that are on this line. How can people get involved with your organization? Um, and then we're going to close out unless Danica and Adrian has any final words. Um, but we'll close out after this. How do folks get engaged with your organizations who are doing this work 24-7 and not just around COVID-19 and not just around the, the recent protests? You know, you all are in the trenches. So I'll start with um, Curleen, then we'll go to Andrea, Martha, and then uh, Tiffany, and we will close out. So at Queens Defenders, um, we have an outreach center, 1857 Mott Avenue. Um, you know, when COVID's over, um, it's open um, to anybody who has any sort of legal issue. You can come and get free consultations. We have been providing food. Um, to the public like every week and to some of our clients. Um, our young people also work there. We're getting our young people involved in going to the precinct council meetings, going to community board meetings. So if you have a young person um, who wants something positive to do, they can always come to the Outreach Center. We also have the Rockaway Justice Center, which is our new community court. Um, we're looking for members of the community to get involved and to participate in administering justice in your own community. So queensdefenders.org. Um, and I'll just say, uh, just first, you know, this work is long-term. Um, this is not, we're in this for the long haul. Uh, we can't just see a few wins now and be satisfied with that. This is, there's long-term structural changes that have to happen. Um, so I really just wanna encourage folks to find a political home. Um, and for young people who live in Rockaway between the ages of 13 through 24, you can sign up on our website, rytf.org. Um, you click on where it says um, get involved and it'll bring you to a form to find out how you can get involved, fill in your information. Um, and we'll reach back out to you about how you can join the Rockaway Youth Task Force um, and our fight to to make changes to our community because we know that the folks who who, imp um, who are most impacted by issues are the ones who have the best solutions um, and so that's really what we're seeing in this moment so I want to encourage any young people watching any parents um, anyone who knows uh, young people who can join the organization and, and get involved um, we have a issue of the Rockway Advocate which is our quarterly newspaper uh, magazine uh, which is going to be mailed out to about 18,000 folks um, around the, to the peninsula, um, focusing on COVID, the census, um, and just the overall um, movement that's happening right now. So um, if folks can keep an, an eye out for that, but that's how you get involved, rytf.org, um, and click get involved, um, and also fill out your census. Uh, we need resources for our community. Martha. Um, so my C3 volunteer hat is the Queens Coordinated Council. Uh, we are a Facebook group. Uh, we are nonpartisan out just organizing and talking to folks about, you know, getting out to vote. We had, we hosted a two Queens Borough President forums online. And um, we also held our peace rally in Forest Hills. So we're doing a lot of organizing and just good community work. And my other C4 hat is the new reformers. Uh, you could check us out. We're running uh, community-based activists for party positions to start moving the party left and start talking to folks about getting more involved in state committee and the DNC stuff. Awesome. Alain, followed by Tiffany for closing remarks. And I want to thank Tiffany for putting this together. Uh, thank you all for having me on. I'm looking forward to working with you all. You all could uh, visit our Facebook page, the NAACP Jamaica branch. Um, we are actively um, doing a lot of work, not just with um, police reform, but building a black agenda um, that we all can uh, gather around. Um, we were supposed to have a, a national convention in July, but honestly, due to COVID, um, that can't happen. But we are continuing to push things forward. Um, I just want to send a big shout out to uh, uh, Lieutenant Shoshana Winter, who actually was in the comments. 
um, given some great ideas. I would love for you all to connect with her. Um, she's a sister and she was a lieutenant in the 113 and she moved up. Um, really awesome person, but I'm definitely looking forward to building with you all um, as we um, you know, cultivate a community that we all want to conserve. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Tiffany. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to you as well for um, allowing me to even organize something so important and necessary. Um, and I will say on behalf of It's For You, um, you can join anyone looking to um, volunteer or um, do community service. You can uh, stay up to date by joining our Facebook group and following us on Instagram at It's For You. Uh, we are looking for community members to join our cultural and creative programs and initiatives through sustainability and um, workshops and events to just overall serve the community. So we also want to, it has been said several times on this call, please, if you have not completed your census, the census, it takes five minutes, maybe less than five minutes. Um, and make sure that you vote. I um, filled out the absentee ballot. It literally takes one minute. I looked at the clock and it, it takes a blink of an eye to complete the uh, absentee ballot. So make sure um, that you're voting uh, and you encourage your friends and family members to vote because it is important in creating the change that we spoke about on this call and having the conversation and promoting our agenda and, and, and overall um, controlling our narrative. Well, I wanna thank you all for coming out and spending an evening with us. And um, I hope you got something from this. And, and I wanna thank all the panelists because I think it was important for us to have this conversation to give folks the space. I know everybody's been home for those who haven't been to the protest. It's really gave them an opportunity, a key opportunity to just hear um, what are some things we're up to. Uh, you can follow us this week on Thursday at council.nyc.gov council.nyc.gov will be voting out some major pieces of legislation. Um, Want to thank Danique and Adrian for really spearheading a lot of the big pieces of legislation using our political power collectively within the council to move an agenda that would work for our community and really reform the police department. But it's the beginning, you know, the, the, uh, this is a lifetime of struggle as most of us um, will know and have seen, but this is all about our kids. This is about my son. This is about your daughters and grandchildren, you know, them being able to come up in a society where they don't feel over-policed and where um, the resources are being um, concentrated in their community. So I wanna thank you all for coming out. And I don't know if the neat ones in, um, but if not, we are all out. Stay peace, Black Lives Matter. When, bla when, when Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. And we're not afraid to say that. Um, unapologetically black and there's nothing wrong with that doesn't mean we're anti-white it means we have to continue to cultivate our communities and work together to build the strength to make sure that our communities are better moving forward so thank you all for coming out have a great evening be safe social distance and uh, i'll see y'all out there all right god bless you all have a great evening Bye.